Well, she proved that she wanted to do anything for the million and also known for one of the greatest comebacks ever in Amazing Race history in the final leg. Please welcome one half of the winners from season seven, Joyce. Thanks so much for joining the Random Reality Star podcast. Uh, thank you for having me. It's so good to, to still talk about this. It's been a while now. So it's nice to, to have a throwback conversation about this because it still affects my life to this day. So yeah. it's good. Shout out to Team Guido for setting this up. You yeah. Guys I know you guys will probably be watching this, I hope. But okay. uh, for my first question is, talk about your casting process. Was it your idea to go on the race? Uh, why did you choose your husband at the time to be your partner? Um, <laughs> and maybe just uh, go through all that good stuff. Oh, wow. Um, so probably like a lot of folks, you know, it's, it's like you've always dreamt about traveling around the world and uh, the only problem is you don't have the money to pay for it. So when I saw <laughs> in the paper, they were looking for teams to travel around the world on a competition show. Um, I thought, oh my goodness, this is us. Cause we would go to vacations and at resorts, we'd always do the team challenges. So we were always the winners on those. And I thought, you know, how easy is that going to be? And we're going to be able to travel around the world. So this will be a breeze. Yeah. So, so going into that, maybe what stood out, like, uh, what stood out um, for your team, like in the casting process that maybe pushed you over the edge, maybe? And then uh, it's been a long time, but maybe what were your first impressions of the teams from season seven, even before like meeting them? Do you even remember those? Yeah. Um, okay. So the casting process, um, that was really long and strenuous. So if anybody's looking to get on the show, it's not as simple as you would think, you know, I remember applying and, um, we got a notice that said, uh, actually they said they wanted to see us. And so we had to go to our local place, which was another town away. We were in Houston. Maybe we had to go to Dallas. We went to Dallas and we we're like, yay, we're going to be on the show. And no, we never heard from them again. So, and they always say, don't send in another tape. Well, the next time we sent in another tape yeah. and uh, we didn't hear anything at all. And then the next round, it took us like three tries and we sent it in again. The third time we decided we're going to do something to stand out. And we decided to be the couple that um, could blend in anywhere around the world. So we did all these different scenarios of us in different parts of the world trying to blend in. It was hilarious. And so it really got us noticed. But I think what really got the notice was the fact that my husband at the time, Chenna, he left in all of the bad excerpts. Yeah. Yeah, it was not just three minutes long. He left it all in and initially, of course, we're being all sweet and good and kind to each other and funny. But then, you know, during the outtakes, we're just cursing each other, saying, what did you do that for? That was stupid. And, you know, and uh, but he sent all of that in. And I think that's what got us on, to tell you the truth. Yeah, I hear that a lot with people, how it's like the outtakes and how they have all this stuff planned out. And then the thing that's yeah. like all the bloopers. Out the yeah. Of the shows. I think they want real people, you know, they don't want you to go in being your best good self. They want to see what are you really going to be like under stress and how is it going to really be? Because it always changes. So obviously going into season seven, you guys had six seasons to watch. So maybe what did you expect going into the race? And then what was it like kind of running it? And maybe how did that opinion change or stuff like that? Well, oh, and you also asked me about the teams. What did I think about the teams? Yeah. I remember when we got there um, our, on our third try, um, the, it's funny, the casting process, they put you in a hotel. You're not allowed to talk to anyone. Um, you're only allowed to leave your room for feeding and working out. And you have to be escorted so that you're not talking to other people. But we soon learn that they only bring in so many of your exact same type. So I knew 
being known a uh, black couple that there was only going to be so many other black couples. So every time we'd see other black couples with the production assistant, we knew that they were our competition. And so the longer we stay, because the next day you might not see them at lunchtime and they'd be gone. So we knew that, you know, okay, we might be in. Well, when we finally got cast and we came to uh, LA and we met the other teams, the one thing that struck us was this one team, Robin Amber, and yeah. they were kind of treated like royalty. And we kept thinking, oh, they're probably not going to be on our show because, you know, they're, they're clearly able to talk to people. They're on the cell phone. They're doing all this stuff that we weren't allowed to do. And we thought, oh, they must yeah, they, we were like, what's going on? So when we learned that they really were going to be on our show, we were like, okay, they must definitely be the celebrities. So, um, but yeah, getting on the show, the whole start of everything, um, I think it was a lot more involved than I would have ever thought. I, you know, who knew that a reality show, there's so much production that goes behind the scenes before they actually start, but you know, it was definitely way different than I thought. Well, and I read your uh, Wikipedia page and you've acted in some stuff before. So I'm sure you had like experience in the camera. So maybe uh, talk about like, what's the difference between that and maybe reality TV where it's not like a script and you're not like on a set? Like, is it is it like hugely different or were you like, I'm kind of used to this or? Um, you know what? Um, well, as you know, if you're acting on a set, you're being a character. Yeah. So, I mean, in reality, people are looking at you and your true self. So major difference. And, and it definitely felt different because you're thinking, wow, they're really staring at me. I'm not in character. This is the real me. And how am I acting? And then you become a little bit more in your head about, how am I presenting myself? And, you know, but soon after you start the race, all of those thoughts about who you are, who you're being goes out the window because it's a whole nother challenge. Yeah. So going into the first, like, talk about that experience. You get to go to Chile and you have to guide that llama. Now I'm obsessed with llamas because at the zoo, they used to spit on my brother. So that was pretty fun. <laughs> so maybe just talk about you get to Chile you have to guide that llama and you're on, you have to go on a zip line too. So for first leg, you guys had to do a decent amount of stuff. So maybe yeah. just talk about those experiences where you're like, what the heck have I gotten myself into? Or you're like, this is awesome. Yeah. Um, the very first leg we went to Peru. And um, what I did notice is that we were driving up a mountainside and I thought, oh, my heart's racing now because I'm terrified of heights. And I thought as long as we don't have to do anything with heights, I really was terrified of a lot of things. So it was really a kind of not the smartest thing going into the amazing race with all the fears I have, fears of flying, fears of height, fears of cutting my hair off, um, all those sort of things, you know. But um, yeah, that very first thing that we had to do was go up the mountain. When we first got to the airport, they had everyone drink a bottle of tea. It was coca tea. And they said that this tea helps you with the height illness so and sicknesses. Yeah. So that was really something. And I thought, why do we have to drink this tea? So yeah, we got to the top of the mountain. And the very first thing I saw was, we are way up here. There's a little small cavine, cavasse below with water. And I thought, oh my God, I'm going to die. So I was absolutely terrified and they're like step up here put this on put a head you know a uh, camera on your head and step over to the edge my biggest fear ever i was mortified so yeah yeah well just talk about how physically exhausting that was so then you drive up the twisting mountain which i probably would have got mountain sick and then you have to go on a zip line and then you have to like drag a llama like a mile and oh, a half gosh. yeah once i once my heart finally started beating properly after my first zip line over the first mountain and I finally got down to land I thought oh okay that was actually fun and uh, then they said to bring these llamas 
or lead them to their cages to their and I thought oh how cute they are and and I remember pulling them and I'm trying to talk to them like we talk to dogs and cats and yes. and then the thing spit in my face and I thought okay this is messed up <laughs> and, and it totally changed my attitude because I thought oh my god I can't believe this thing is spitting on me how rude yeah but, I wanted to kick it because this, it, it really tried to kick us. It did everything it could to, to not do what we wanted it to do. But when we were on the zip, when I was on the zip line, I saw that Meredith and um, her and uh, his wife, they, and Gretchen, they were wow. pulling the llamas along. It seemed so easy. Yeah. So I thought, oh, they're going to be nice, but no, they weren't nice. And uh, one thing that I did learn about that was, animals like to go in pairs or with other animals so we tried to take one at a time don't do that yeah well unfortunately you weren't the llama whisperer for meredith and gretchen i guess they could put that on the resume yeah <laughs> they did it very easily it was not easy but uh after that you guys finish in uh eighth place sort of near the bottom and was that like a wake-up call like this is a lot harder than it actually seems to be because it the took you a little bit to get your groove oh the say that again i said it took you a little while to get your groove you know um i think from the very first mountain top in peru that was the wake-up call and from then on i was thinking okay this is not a breeze whatsoever this is heart-wrenching this is difficult and um it's a lot harder than i thought and and the other thing was, um, we didn't know, I remember getting to um, uh, our first base and I thought, okay, where do we go from here? Are they gonna put us in a hotel? What are they gonna do with us? You know, where's my clue? And I'm thinking, you know, we should be, somebody should be telling us what to do. This is the first time I realized that whatever money we had, was supposed to carry us through till we get to the next leg. But by then we were already broke. We were yeah. out of money and, and we didn't know where we we're supposed to stay or what we we're supposed to do. And I think we had to, if I'm not mistaken, I think we stayed at a, um, at the beach or did we stay? I don't remember. Did the we beach, stay at the beach? You stayed at the beach, uh, right before the, right before you went to the mountains and the zip line. So you like, you got to Peru, you yeah. stayed at the beach for the night, then you went to the right. zip line or whatever, and then you went right. to the village and the pit stop. Okay, yeah, so when we were in that city, that town, um, we had to actually beg for some money to stay in a hostel. So I had no idea that no one was gonna tell us what to do. We were, we were supposed to go to, I believe, Arequipa, and we needed to get on a plane, but there were no more flights leaving that day. So we had to find a place to stay the night. And so we actually begged for money and we finally stayed in my first hostel ever. So yeah, yeah. it was awakening. I heard that, uh, I heard in an interview a while back that Ron and Kelly stayed at a brothel in India or somewhere. <laughs> so that was pretty funny. But, uh, you do what you gotta do, yeah. you know? It's surprising how you how you be, become really resourceful because man, it's difficult. Yeah, so going into the second leg, there wasn't too much, I don't think that was really featured on you, at least by watching it. Yeah, but, because uh, we were so sad and we were at the bottom, <laughs> at the end of the line. Who did? The back of the pack. But uh, at least in the second leg, who did you guys initially bond with? Because it seems like you struck up an accord with Ray and Dina and Rob and Amber in the beginning, but was there anyone else that you kind of were like, it said that you talked to them about an alliance, maybe what was it, what was it about them that struck you? And was there anyone that you initially bonded with um, yeah. in the beginning that we didn't get to see? Uh, well, first of all, we adored Meredith and Gretchen. Um, we definitely loved Dina and Ray. Um, and Rob and Amber were at the top a lot. So we thought we need to hang out with some people that are at the top because apparently we're doing something really wrong. Yeah. And what are they doing and how are they moving so fast? One thing we learned though was 
our bags, our backpacks were way overstuffed. I think at one time at the airport, we weighed our bags and everyone laughed at us because they said, you guys have like Target, the whole store on your back. <laughs> and it was the heaviest I think ever. And I was really struggling to run with it. And, and I think when we were at the beach, I dumped all my clothes out on the beach. I dumped my snacks and everything else I had. And I left most of that stuff at the beach. So we learned from the people at the top what they were doing. And they were traveling light. Yeah, I always said if I ever get on The Amazing Race, my best friend who's like a 6'4", 240 baseball player, which we're like mm -hmm. exact opposites. I'm like, you're the one carrying the bag. I'm not carrying anything. I'm going to be completely <laughs> panicked the entire time. So that's your job. Oh my gosh, that becomes like a liability is that dog on backpack. And you know, I mean, at some point you're just dirty all the time. So what difference does it make? Yeah. I so, need all those clothes. <laughs> so going into to the third leg, I have to bring up, this is an underrated moment. Talk about how bad riding that horse was because it bucked you off its saddle a couple of times and that did not look fun. Oh my gosh, I remember thinking how fun I'm going to get to ride a horsey. And um, once again, I'm from the city. I know nothing about horses. I just have taken horse rides at really nice places and they have someone leading the horses, but I didn't know what I was doing. And so I picked the horse I thought looked nice. That's so stupid. And um, this horse did not want me to get on his back. Every time I attempted to get up on his back, he would move, he would jump, he would buck. And I finally said, can I, can I please get another horse? They said, no. And I think that's part of the show. You know, it's part of what are you going to do now then? You know, so I thought I'm just going to have to ride it out. And, and it was definitely difficult. I, at one point I thought, oh my God, this is my Christopher Reeves moment. You know, I'm going to yeah. end up being thrown off the horse. I'm going to break my back. And this is when it all goes bad. But, you know, after, I think I was out there probably four hours. You would never know wow, it. It didn't seem that long. I mean, oh, yeah, because they, they don't have that much film and footage to put in a one-hour show. <laughs> you know? So, yeah, a lot of people were out there for a long time. But I finally finished. And, boy, what I realized, though, is when I finally got the, the hang of it and I finally got this horse doing what I wanted it to do, Every time I get to the finish and get ready to, to put the, put the uh, whatever that is that we have to put through the ring, my husband at the time was standing there screaming, come on, come on, you got it, you got it. And the horse was freaked out. And we finally realized, oh my God, it's him. And so the horse would never go past that ring until he finally moved. I said, okay, you've got to get out of here and be quiet. So finally, the horse finally went under the ring and I was able to accomplish it, but it was difficult. Yeah, that's awesome. And I bet you probably were thinking at that time, like, yeah, now I'm a lot stronger than I thought I was. And now I can contribute, like really, really contribute to the team. Not that you were thinking that before, but it might've definitely given you that boost. Of, yeah, like, confidence, um, maybe. No, I really think that at that moment I felt even weaker. I oh, don't think really? it was that moment yet because I think, I thought this is way harder than I thought because for most things, they don't show you how long you're out there trying to accomplish this task. I mean, you may be out there for forever and, and they just stay and film and, you know, and it, it's, it's, it's very trying. But um, so I think I was starting to break down for, from the beginning. So it was way harder than I thought. Yeah, well, that's really cool. And my bad, I totally forgot about leg three, and I totally forgot to ask you questions about that. So going into leg three, you uh, finish higher than you did. Uh, you finished in a better place in leg two, so you're kind of getting your groove. How bad was that whitewater rafting? And how bad was the whitewater rafting in general? Because you guys had a ton of, like, boat challenges and all-stars and in your first season, and I hate boats, so... Maybe just describe both experiences on how bad whitewater rafting was because I would die. I would be like crying the entire time. So, <laughs> you know what? Um, the one thing about Amazing Race is, you know, it's not even about the show as much as it's about you finding out and discovering who you are, 
you know, in these moments. And so I don't think I had ever gone rafting. Like I said, I'm from the city. And so I never been on a raft and uh, didn't know how to do any of it. And so I, I do remember I had new tennis shoes on and this was retarded. Um, I remember they put the boats in the water and they said, okay, pick a team and select the boat. So we picked a team and I'm standing on the edge of the, of the water of the river. And I'm thinking, okay, is somebody going to bring the boat over to me? Or how is this going to happen? And they're all standing there looking at me like, um, what are you doing? Like, come on. And I realized everybody has to walk through the water. So that was my, my intro. I thought, okay, my shoes are now wet. And then I, I had nails as girls do. I had long nails. Um, and I remember thinking, oh my God, I don't swim either. Oh, all these problems that I had being a city girl thinking I can do this. Right. So um, when we get on the boat, and, oh, and they tell you all about the problems that you could have. You can be thrown out. If you get thrown out, just stay there. Hang on. We'll throw you in there too. And I thought, there's no way I'm falling out of this boat. I am staying in it. It yeah. kills me. <laughs> and I didn't want to get my hair wet either, which is, you know, another silly girl thing. And uh, I think the very first wave went over our heads. So that went out the window. Um, I broke my nails trying to cling on for dear life. And, and they said, okay, you guys have to sit in the front because you're going to be on camera. But the people in the front are the hardest working paddlers. So I really had to dig in to get through that. But oh my God, yeah, I've never been on a, a raft up until that time. So it was difficult. It was trying, it was tiring. And I thought to myself, I was crying at one point, but you couldn't tell because I was all wet. And, <laughs> and it was seven miles, I believe. I thought, are you kidding me? And you know, so it's very tiring. And, um, and I didn't learn how to raft anymore on that show than I did the next one. So yeah, I haven't taken up rafting still. Yeah, which I'll definitely talk about All-Stars later, but since they were the same challenge, I guess I'll talk about the rafting challenge in All-Stars now. Yeah. Um, so which one was harder? Were you like craft when you would do it again? Or were you like, oh, it's deja vu or like? <laughs> uh, the first one was the hardest because I just didn't know what to expect. And I was too, being too prissy. And, and, and I think towards the end, I think after everything happened. I, I think I lost all my prissiness and that went out the window and then I became stronger towards the end. So it took me some time, but the first one was definitely harder. Yeah. So going into that, like how beautiful were the Andes and then also um, how glad were you not ever having to eat all those pig parts and all that other oh nasty stuff oh. that looked. It was horrific. Well, First of all, we were starving. And as we drove up there, I could smell what smelled like an amazing barbecue. So I thought, oh, this is going to be good. They're going to feed us. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God, the surprise. Um, but we get there and, I, and they said, who is um, able, who's not, who eats beef or who eats meat? Who's a meat eater? So I thought, oh, he better do it because I thought, I don't know. I'm not that curious about meat and I'm not I and I won't eat everything and so when we got there he was starving so he was scarfing it down but what happens is after like an hour or hour and a half it all starts to get cold and so then it starts becoming greasy and underneath it while it was on the platter you could not tell what was what yeah. I mean you could tell some ribs that maybe you've seen but most of the stuff was very foreign so I was so happy I didn't have to eat that because even he was getting sick at they said that at about uh, a human person could only handle maybe two pounds of food before you start to give it up before it started to come out. And so it was like four pounds, I think, or I don't know, however heavy yeah, it was. Four pounds. Yeah, it was way more than anybody could really handle. And so um, 
it was gross. And, and most people were spitting out, spitting it out, throwing it up or drinking water. And, oh, and the other thing that I don't know if they showed was the flies that came in once it got cold. <laughs> it was yeah, buckets I to throw up, buckets of half-eaten food and flies. It was yeah. disgusting. Yeah, God, I was so glad I didn't do it. Got to be one of the grossest, amazing race eating challenges. I mean, the caviar in season five looked awful, but Mm-mm. it's got it's got to be up there. My favorite was so you saw all of that, and then it was just like a little montage of Susan eating the little piece of beef jerky and being like, "I'm starving," and then it's showing everybody else being like miserable at the roadblock because they're so far <laughs> behind. Oh my God! Yeah, we were. It was hard. I'm so glad he did it though, because he was he was a, like a champ, and we should have come in first that time. But yeah. we we ended up getting lost as we did a lot. We got lost a lot. So um, anyway, we I think we came in second. Yeah, you came in second because of bad driving or got bad out. driving. That was uh, that was us for sure. Bad driving. <laughs> I think you start to I think you start to uh, question yourself when you're going long and you're feeling like this might be wrong. And almost every single time we would turn around only to come back to that very spot, pass it up. And it seems like the place was maybe another block or so. So that was one of those things that I, that stuck with me for life. Like sometimes, you know, you think you want to give up, you want to turn around and go back, but just keep going. Cause sometimes it's just, one more block you just have a little ways to go so that was one of those lessons but yeah we did that a lot we questioned ourselves all the time yeah so then going into that fourth flight how annoyed were you to see robin amber on that flight and then um how bad was that boat where you had to kind of find the clue or whatever because it looked like an an inflatable raft with an engine and i'm like this thing is probably gonna sink like they're gonna be stuck in a swamp (laughs) <laughs> oh wait is this when we were in um when we had to find we had to match the boat to the picture yeah. the 30 year old picture or something yeah that looked that looked awful like in terms of like vehicle i don't know what the word is like construction of a vehicle like how bad was that well what was really awful was First of all, the, as you saw at the end, the boat looked nothing like the picture because it had been abandoned and sitting there forever. And so it's totally torn up. But the worst thing for me, <laughs> I don't even know if I should share this, but uh, the worst thing for me is that I had to use the restroom. And so <laughs> I kept thinking if the water splashes on me, I'll pretend I used the bat uh, that yeah. was just the water. But it was, we were out there for, hours looking for this thing it was horrible but um yeah that was that was complicated i remember that that was one of those things i wanted to forget (laughs) yeah so then you go from the water and all that good stuff from the third and fourth leg and then you get to go to africa so how exciting was that um those like uh, definitely the fifth and sixth legs were kind of like huge highlights for you guys in terms of maybe mm-hmm. like your story arc. And you obviously talked about in the beginning about how not having a, how you, you know, struggles with uh, having a child. Mm-hmm. So maybe just talk about in Africa, like how much fun that was and how cool is it or dangerous was it repelling down the cave and Oh. No, yeah, Africa is definitely one of the highlights for me of that show. Um, wow, I was so excited going to Africa, and all I kept thinking is, I want to go on a safari, and I would just die if I get to go see elephants and giraffes, just you know, out in its wilderness. But um, but you know, we had to go through a few other things before we even got to that point. Um, uh, I think we had to. Uh, go to Soweto first. I think we went to Soweto and um, I remember driving, oh, we had to go to a village and we had to pick up um, goods to take to an orphanage. And that was after the repelling. that, That was after the repelling. Okay, so the repelling, once again, another one of my fears, <laughs> a, fr- a fear of the unknown, 
rappelling into a cave where it's completely dark and I'd never repelled either. So I'm repelling into this cave, it's dark. And when we got down in the cave, it wasn't too bad. And they said, find the clue. Now that's where one of my biggest horrors ever happened because inside the cave, you could see a little bit, you know, where you're going. But I think after walking back and forth in this cave for a while, we realized that, okay, it's clearly not clearly visible. So, I saw this little tiny opening in a, in one of the walls of the cave. It was a dirt opening. And I thought, that's the only other place that we haven't explored, but there's no way that CVS is going to have us climbing through that small opening because clearly not everybody could fit through that little opening because it was very tight and I remember thinking we just we're just gonna have to check it out because this is the only other place and we'd been in there too long so we climb in there and I probably two minutes in I thought I am not doing this oh hell no this is this is scarier than ever because the dirt is falling on your head falling in and you're getting it in your mouth I mean it was literally as wide as my shoulders almost and really claustrophobic and it was frightening and I thought oh god no I'm not doing this so I backed out of my husband was like no 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 come on come on we're gonna do we gotta do this we gotta do this so I just thought oh my goodness and I and we went through and at one point I did see a, a red laser light and I thought is there a camera in here <laughs> there's no way so if there's a camera in here we're on the right track yeah. but that was freaky to see a little light in there so it was a camera and we made it through but when we got out, I remember thinking, I can't hardly breathe. I was pulling dirt and rocks out of my nose, out of my mouth, out of my hair, completely covered in dirt. But it was really horrifying when I saw Meredith he came running over there and said, where's Gretchen? And I remember thinking, what do you mean? And she's with you. Oh, so you saw that when she got hurt? Well, we, we had just come out and they had come in after us. And so Meredith said, well, did you see Gretchen come out? And I said, no. And, he, and we were all freaked out because we thought, well, where the heck did Gretchen go? And so we heard then, or we saw a commotion, all these people running inside. And then we see her come out and she's all bandaged up and she's bloody from head to toe. And we thought, oh my God, what happened? So we saw the replay like everyone else that she fell off of one of the ledges and busted her head and had to get stitches. But she's such a trooper. She said, I'd always wanted a facelift, which yeah. is amazing. That was so cute, but she's, she's such a trooper. But, but yeah, that was frightening, that whole experience. Yeah, that's oh. weird. That's Go weird ahead. that they didn't show, well, they obviously showed the, sorry for interrupting. They yeah, that's okay. It's weird that they didn't show your guys' reaction to it because the way that it was edited, it was like you guys left um, and then it just happened to that. They got out of the cave, they went back in and then it happened. Yeah. It was weird that they showed it like that rather than... Yeah, that. they were our buddies, man. And I was very worried about um, Meredith and or Gretchen. And I thought we, we're not leaving here till we figure out what's happened to her because we didn't know. Um, but then we saw them coming out and then it was like, oh, that was so, that was so amazing just to see her come out, but she was all bloodied and we thought, what the heck, what happened? And, um, but yeah, she fell. But one thing I don't think they showed was while we were in Africa, they took us to a, a reserve, a game reserve, and they allowed us, they took us out to, um, feed the lions. Yeah, they showed that. That was in the next leg. That was going to be my... Ah, okay, the next leg. Okay. Yeah. So then, okay, after that, I think that's when we went into town and we had to buy goods for the orphanage. And uh, my yeah. husband went into the... He did the he did the task. He bought the items. I stood there, but while I stood there, people were telling me that I shouldn't be there. To, that was dangerous, which was frightening and I thought oh god I just want to get out of here so bad and they said why are you standing why are you here and I thought oh we're just filming and they were like it's not safe you shouldn't be here but um we we finally got the stuff went to the orphanage 
And that's where I lost it, I think, because, you know, I've been wanting to have a child for so long at that point, and, and I hadn't really mentioned it to anyone. And so when we saw those kids just applauding and cheering and, you know, and some of them didn't really look well, but they were happy anyway. Um, I just thought, wow, we're so blessed to have a home and have all these things that, and we wanted a child. And I thought, wow, any one of these kids could have been my kid. But um, yeah, and people asked us where we're going to go back. But of course, we didn't go back because there's so many kids in America that, you know, needed homes too. And we thought, wow, we can do that when we get home and adopt a kid, which we tried. We tried, but I won't go into all of that. But. Yeah, so um, it's funny because I actually interviewed Mary and Peach from season two, and they actually had very similar experiences to you that you were just talking about. They went to a village and they were like, it's not safe to be here, you'll die. And they were in Africa, like near where Nelson Mandela's prison cell was. Oh, yeah, that's and, where we, yeah, that's where. Yeah, yeah, so they were near the same location and they had the same experience. And then when I interviewed uh, Peach, she actually had to go in a bat cave where they had to get a clue in a dark mm. cave with a bunch of bats. She was like, oh my goodness, it you know, was awful. So it's funny that they kind of, have, they did similar challenges and mm -hmm. kind of similar experiences. Mm -hmm. But um, my absolute favorite thing was driving through the jungle though. Um, we did the challenge with the, with the, with the um, tree moving the branch. Um, the one thing they didn't share with us was that that um, river was full of crocodiles and hippos. They didn't tell us that. So oh, yeah. as we we're driving through, they just said, just don't stop in the water. You know, if, you're, if your car, if your vehicle gets flooded, you know, you have one of those vehicles and the water will be able to be pushed out, but just try to keep going, keep it in low gear. And uh, so glad that we got stuck at one point, but, um, and of course, listening to the, to Phil narrate it later, he's talking about what's in the water. And I thought, oh my God, if I'd have known that, yeah. if I'd have known that it would not have been so, oh my gosh, look at all the animals. Yeah. We didn't see anything in the water. Of course, we're just trying to get to the other side, but, um, but yeah, getting to the actual, um, River Kwai, where we had our um, pit stop at. Um, and then we were, I remember being third. We came in third. Yeah. And I was thinking, thank God we're done. Because going through the jungle, it's hard to make your way through there. And, and then they said, you didn't complete something. That was horrifying. Yeah. And they don't tell you how to go back. Of course, they had a path for anybody coming in, but there wasn't a path to go back out. So we were trying to find our way back out. And I remember driving out of the camp thinking, and it, and it was funny because going in, we were all like, ooh, and ah, look at all the animals. And on the way back out, we were like dead silent because we don't know where we're going. We don't know how to get back. We don't even know what we forgot to do. And I think I saw every animal in the jungle yeah. by a, a, a little small river that we passed. And I thought, what if something happens to the car? What if we get stuck? What if we need help? And at, there were times when our crew, their phones wouldn't work in certain spots just because, you know, it, it, you need the Mom, you need wireless I mean, coverage. But, uh, but yeah, there were times where we thought, you don't call AAA if you get stuck out in the jungle. You, you, what do we do? So it was really terrifying, but we did find our way back. And uh, thank goodness. But staying at the River Kwai in, that, uh, in Botswana was amazing because I felt a little more protected. They would, they would walk us to our rooms. They'd walk us to get food with someone carrying a rifle, um, which was great. And so they just said, just don't come out of your room. And at night, you certainly don't even step outside because that's when the hippos come on land. And if the hippos come on land, they think this is their territory. And the hippos, it only takes one bite to snap you in half. They don't want to eat you. They just, they just fear you and they think you're trying to encroach on their territory. So we were terrified. But um, I remember the next morning, 
um, just looking out the window, we stayed in these thatched roof tents, which was amazing. And, and only feet from the river, and in the river, we could hear the hippos all night just making all this noise. And at night, by the way, you can hear them on land running. You hear animals pounding on your roof and walking around your door. So it was really frightening at nighttime. But during the day, it was nice and peaceful and beautiful. And I remember looking out the window and I saw these baboons that came down to the river. And I thought, oh, how cute they are. And, um, and I had been sitting out on the porch for a minute. We had a little break and, um, and they told us to not have any food or drink in your room because any animals would be attracted to that. But I remember I had a martini, I snuck a martini there. Um, and I spilled it trying to run because I saw the baboons. I ran inside and zipped it up. And by the time I woke up, my husband to come look at the baboons, they were on our porch. They were already on our porch and we're like a plastic sheet away from these baboons and we're trying to be really quiet. And about six of them jumped up on our porch. Oh, I would be terrified. It was terrifying. And I thought, oh my God, I wish I had a camera. I wish I had a camera. And I didn't. And I, and as soon as they heard us, you could see them, they would show their teeth. Like when they're scared, they show their teeth and, yeah. and then they took off running. And I thought, man, this is an incredible adventure. So that was amazing. I wish they would have shown that maybe in a deleted scene or on a DVD or something like that. But it's funny because you keep answering my questions without even me having to ask them. So you're doing an amazing job. But, uh, <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. No, you're, you're great. Like, I don't even have to ask my questions. Like you're reading my mind. Like, it's, uh, it's okay, good. Okay, good. <laughs> but, yeah, that, that was Botswana was very memorable. Is beautiful memory and it, it's one of those places I'd love to go back to but I know it's very expensive so I'd yeah. love to go back someday. So maybe just like what was that like like you go in the safari like a couple of things that people want to do in Africa which they used to do was go visit Victoria Falls which obviously you guys didn't get to do oh, and I went to go to an African safari so what was that like and also uh did you ever consider taking up spear throwing for a career because you kicked Boston <laughs> Rob's ass in that roadblock where you had to throw the spear and hit the target. So how cool was that? <laughs> oh my God. You know what? Um, I, I realized something about myself that every time it was my turn to do something, I was terrified and I didn't think I could do it. And so, but I knew that we could not leave until I do it. And so most of the times I just thought, okay, put your big girl panties on and now you just gotta just do it. You can do it, you can do it. So I had a lot of self-talks, but um, that was one of those that I really had a hard time the very first time I threw it. I realized I could not throw whatsoever, but um, with practice, and desperation, I wanted to get out of there. Uh, I finally got it. I was so jazzed. I was so jazzed. But I realized um, in, the old, in the old amazing races, they used to allow, they didn't have a, a minimum or a maximum of how many um, challenges that, teams, that teammates could do. And later on, they yeah. made it so you had to split it. But I liked the old ones because I didn't want to do any of them. Well. <laughs> <laughs> but they made it now where you got to do half and half. So, yeah. so, so you wanted to be like the Colin and Christy or the Chip and Kim from season five. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> absolutely. Because I realized that these things were beyond where I saw myself or what I thought I could do. But as it turns out, you know, if you change your mind about something, maybe you can. And I did. And I did. <laughs> So, what was it like seeing Brian and Greg wreck their car, and then how bad was it sleeping on those little cots for the entire night on the pit stop or whatever, because they didn't show that, that but, but that kind of looked rough when you were in the middle of the desert, and there was just like six beds or whatever. <laughs> and I was like, well, the, when I saw their Jeep turnover, my very first thought, and I'm not going to lie, was, oh my God, we're going to get ahead of them. 
which is really, really sad. Yeah. And then I thought, oh my God, but they might be hurt. So, you know, we, we were slowing down and we were going, should we stop and help? But we were thinking, what can we do? So we stopped and we yelled and then the, um, our crew said, we'll call, we'll call someone. And, um, and they were like, just keep going, you know, and just, and so we did. Um, but it was really scary because they, you know, they always said not to drive fast. And especially in that area, because it's, it's dirt, you know, and it's not very settled. It's very dusty. So if you're flying around that dust, you're going to skid and they must've been flying. But um, what was really cool was watching them get back on track and have to race Dina and uh, Ray to the finish line. And I was watching it from afar and I felt like I saw two giraffes just run ahead and Ray and Dina, like they weren't even moving. It was pretty amazing to see. But so that was exciting. Um, But when we got to the pit stop, seeing those beds out there in the middle in the um, pan, that was, um, I was thinking this is going to be yet another challenge. But if you can believe it, what happened, what actually happened was, um, it started to um, have thunder and lightning. And these beds were metal beds. Oh, that's not good. Yeah, we were like, are you really going to make us stay out here on a metal bed while it's lightning? So what they decided to do was they set up a camp on a ground. We kind of, they put some pillows on the ground and, you know, we had a makeshift camp on the ground. Um, and we slept outside. It was kind of cool except um, I remember having to go to the bathroom. This is, this happened to me a lot during the show, but I had to go to the bathroom during the middle of the night. And, and I woke up my husband, I said, I got to go to the bathroom. He says, well, go. And I go, well, I don't know where to go. And come go with me. He goes, no. So I, I woke him up. He went with me, but prior to that earlier, they said that, or actually later that night, they told us, or the next day, they told us that they had heard lions in the area oh my and God. so it was just freaky to think that oh my god this is for real the jungle we're out here with the animals and we're in their zoo you know so so this that's another realization you know when you're thinking oh this is so cool it wasn't that cool it yeah was scary. I can only imagine Rob being like Amber's a queen she does not deserve this do you know who we are but, <laughs> right but, uh, yeah yeah, there was no animals for them to talk to because most places they'd go and, and people would go, oh my God, it's Robin Amber. And they'd push us out of the way to make room for Robin Amber. And they're like, do you need anything? Come back here behind our counters, use our phone. And we're like, wait, what about us? We're in this too. So, yeah. yeah. So yeah. Uh, what was it like you have to do that car obstacle course the next leg and you have to move all those like giant logs and stuff like that and what is that like when phil's like you're at the pit stop he's like your team number i think you were four at that time and you're like okay we're safe and then he's like you forgot your road blocker clue what is yeah, that that's what i was saying when we got there we had to go back out that's that time that that happened um yeah that was the most frightening part because we didn't know how to go back nobody had a plan or a path to go back and and that's when i literally thought i saw every animal in the jungle because we found a different watering hole or something and every animal seemed to be there and and our car was completely quiet because we were terrified because we were out here in the jungle with the animals and uh so it was it was real it was very real but uh, yeah, that was terrifying. But but I'm glad we found out what we needed to do. We just repeated it because they don't tell you what you forgot to do. And we did it. And um, we still came in third. Yeah. So great. So going into the Lucknow India leg, uh, I found it interesting watching just because there was a confessional like at the beginning of the leg where uh, your husband at the time was talking about how you really found your groove about like working together and you finally found like that niche in a way 
was there like any tension that we didn't get to see because you guys seem to be like getting along decently or was there like something where you're like okay now we can win this or what was that whole aspect maybe before like what was he kind of talking about because i was confused just kind of watching that. um i think was that after i shaved my head or no so that was in the that was right before the luck now like so that was right before you got to india so that was like right before you fed the lions right before you were going to fly to india and you were Mm -hmm. you guys were like we finally found our groove with working together. Was there like any tension before that or something like that that we missed? You know, or? Well, we worked together really well, um, but I think we had to figure out what our strengths were. He didn't know what mines were because I was always weakling and, you know, female and always saying I can't and you do it, it's too heavy, that kind of thing. And I think at some point I really realized that that's what I said, I lost all my pris. Um, (laughs) I stopped being, I stopped blaming my femininity for my lack of, you know, strength and ability to do things that I just had never tried. So I think at some point I really tried to become a real partner and not just a liability to him because I really relied on him probably like a lot of women in the relationship, you know, you rely on the stronger half to, to take the lead. And so, um, but I realized I had to take some of the onus on myself and, and I, you know, I just stepped up and, and I think when I stepped up, I think it surprised him as well as it surprised me of what I really could do because, you know, you, you really do, have the self-talk and self-doubt all the time. You talk yourself in and out of doing things that you probably could do, you just don't. And so I had to stop being so fearful. And when I got out of my head, I think I really kind of stepped up and became a teammate. Yeah, so how was India, and I definitely want to get to the head shaving moment in a little bit, but how was just getting to luck now India? Because we've seen it, or at least I've seen it in the past, people look miserable in India. Like they're they're kind of sexist towards women. Um, the streets are always crowded. I always remember in season one watching like Nancy and Emily crying mm. because like they couldn't get tickets and just, yeah. just India looks like a nightmare and I particularly wouldn't want to go there, like just based on what I've seen yeah. as well as the Amazing Race. But what was that like maybe getting to India and you have to deal with like the crowded streets? And then on top of that, once you get done with like the T roadblock and mm-hmm. finding the needle in the haystack challenge where you have to open all those crates, when it feels like you're still racing, you've been traveling for days at that point. So maybe just mm-hmm. guide me through that whole leg oh. that wasn't really a leg. Yeah, um, well, India is definitely a different animal. Um, It was probably the noisiest, most colorful, and most beautiful people that I think I've ever seen and been to. Um, I'd never heard noise like that. I remember thinking it was a beautiful chaos. You know, that was that was my description because um, it was chaotic because it just seemed like there were no rules there. The roads were for anybody that had a horn, including bicycles, tuk-tuks, um, and everybody that had a horn used it every second. So it was just loud and just crazy and, and just extremely packed. And everywhere we went, it was just so odd to be the center that if we're standing there looking or trying to read directions or trying to figure out, well, actually there's no directions. Let me yeah. back that up. There's no directions. Um, but we're trying to read our clue and figure out what it is we're trying to do. And you look up and there's like a hundred people just standing around and, and they, there's no such thing as space. There's no, you know, no room. I mean, they, they're standing like in your face and it's kind of like, uh, do you know where this is? (laughs) Why are you standing here this close to me? What are you doing? And it was just odd that I I still to this day don't understand why they would do that. Just stand around and, and stare at us. And maybe because, I don't know, maybe because of the cameras, I don't know. But um, so yeah, it was very different. Um, 
they in the areas that we would go to and let me just say this parts of india is absolutely beautiful yeah we, that didn't, go to, we didn't go to those parts <laughs> but that temple you went to looked pretty nice like the one where you'd like dress up in the little shawl and go to go yeah. to the temple. that looked pretty decent yeah well for the most part you know the places that we went to were in outer regions outer areas not in the main city areas and so um you know the sewer systems are different than ours <laughs> um and it's weird to see cows just sitting in the middle of the street um and it was it was definitely it, i felt like we were definitely in a third world i mean it was yeah. it was an experience so what was that like after you you do the needle in haystack, you go to, you deliver the tea to everyone in those crowded streets, you're exhausted from flying all day and feels like, guess what? You're still racing. What is that feeling like? So just imagine that you've run the marathon and now you're doing the steel man <laughs> marathon. And then you're like, okay, we get to go and relax for a minute. And then feels like you're still racing. It was it was kind of like we were so exhausted. We were food deprived. We had this much water. Oh God, that would kill me. This much water in India. And um, we're in the middle of places that they don't have a 7-Eleven or, you know, they have like little tiny kiosks with homemade this and that. And we're thinking, where am I going to get water that's, that I can trust? Yeah. Or that's clear. Um, so we're tired, we're hungry, we're thirsty, and we have to keep going. The best thing, I guess, afterwards, after you got over the initial shock, was that we had to go and get on a train but it was just one car. I remember it was only one car when we got there. And then and we had no idea what we we're supposed to do. And as we're sitting and riding and all sitting together, we're thinking, are we supposed to be looking for a clue here? And then someone comes and hands us stuff, a, a clue and a pillow <laughs> and a spread. And then we thought, okay, we're gonna be going somewhere. And we did, and, um, and I thought, oh, great. We have our, we'll, you know, we'll, we'll sleep here and, and uh, I guess they'll tell us at some point what we're going to do. But in the middle of the night, we connected to a full train. And then I remember at some point they started making stops like a commuter train. And we, and when we made, when we got hooked up to the bigger train, we ended up getting a bigger room and we thought, oh, this is great. We had two little tiny twin beds with the bunk beds over the top sort of like on a cruise ship and we had our our bags on the top bunks and we slept on these little tiny little cots and we thought okay and we closed our little drapes so that uh you know we can have our privacy and we waited for clues and i remember waking up at some point and there's a man lying on the floor between us my husband's in this bed over here. I'm on this bed and there's a guy laying on the floor. And then I look up and I see feet dangling on the top bunk, like three sets of feet dangling. And, and I remember asking the guys in the room, I said, oh, are you guys with production? And they just stared at us. And I, and I, at some point I was, I told my husband, I said, you got to wake up. You got to wake up. I don't know. There's men in our room. And all to the point that there's no such thing as space. If there's space, a body can stand there. A body can lay there. A body can sit there. We had, we thought we had this room to ourselves with the bunk beds and no, this is extra room that we were taking up and people just came in there and sat and, and, you know, sat with us and it was the freakiest thing ever. But, um, so luckily we didn't have to do a whole lot that night, yeah. but the next day, we had to start out running. Yes. So, so going to the next day, I got to take you to this iconic moment. We're finally here. Um, talk about, so you get to uh, where you're going after that long 24 hour uh, bus ride 
and you go for the fast forward, but the trick is you don't know what it is. And it actually takes you a decent amount of time to find it. So yes. this is your whole reaction when you figure out it's a head shave. And you know, at this point, if you don't do it, your butts are heading on a plane ride home back to yeah. the USA. So yeah. absolutely. You just take me through that entire mindset because you know, it's shave your head or go home. Yeah, that was um, definitely one of the last things I ever wanted to do <laughs> was to shave my head. And I just kept saying, I hope this fast forward is not what I dread the most. And I think most women can relate to that. Um, you know, it's bad enough. We're always trying to get our hair perfect, trying to grow hair and, and do things for your hair to look great to just to think that for a reality TV show that you might yeah. have to shave your head. So I thought there's no way they're going to do that. They already did that. But I don't remember at that point if anybody had actually done it. You were, I, I think you're the only one. I know for a fact you're the only female to do it. Because yeah. I remember uh, a while back, Rachel Riley from Big Brother in one season. One, yeah, that was. India, and she was like, I don't want to shave my head because my extensions will like fall out and I paid $500 <laughs> for them. Exactly. And we had like a flashback of you or whatever doing it. And then it was like, everyone who's done this has won the race because you were the only one who had done it. So. <laughs> yeah. I, I just remember thinking, you know, we have to go through with this because we were going to go back at one point because we couldn't find the dog on place as we typically had direction, no problems or just finding places where we needed to be. And, um, and so when we got there, I thought there's no way we're going back in that. And when they said, when we read the whole little sign, that said, you know, in order to have blessings and good fortune in your life, you must both shave your head. I thought, oh my God, you've got to be kidding. And, uh, and my husband was like, you don't have to do this. I never wanted you to sacrifice this. And I thought, there's no way we're going back after all the trouble. And we will certainly be last because they went right. We went completely left and we have to go through with this. And I thought, I'm just going to do it, even though I was freaked out by it. Because every time I think about it, and for a woman, I think we think almost like you're, you're cutting my arm off. It felt almost the same at first. And then I'd laugh because I go, I, I really went through a lot of emotions as you saw that. Yeah. I was thinking, oh my God, they're shaved, they're cutting my arm off, they're cutting my hair off. But then, then I go, it's just hair. And then I laugh because I'm going, it's going to grow back, right? I think, I hope. But it was, it was, I went through a lot of emotions with that whole thing because, man, and that was the last thing I ever wanted to do. But it was really freeing afterwards, you know, it really was freeing. I didn't have to worry about how my hair looked the next day. Although I do remember thinking I didn't want anybody to see my head because I felt I felt vulnerable. I felt exposed. I felt ugly. I felt like everyone could see my soul now because, you know, for women, you hide behind your hair, behind makeup, behind all these yeah. things and everything was stripped away. And so, you know, I was there for everyone to see and everyone wanted to see my head. And I thought, oh my God, no. But um, so yeah, that was my most vulnerable ever but at the same token, the most freeing time ever. Well, and it did make you an amazing race icon because you're still featured on the race today, which that's <laughs> always a good thing, I guess. But uh, yeah, no, it was, you know what? It was amazing because it, for once in my life, I don't think I had to deal with hair issues or even what the way I looked. I had to only deal with who I'm being, what my person was and, because now you, I couldn't hide from anything, you know, I had to be my true self. So that was, that was, um, it was a lot of exposure for me. I felt very naked, but, um, but it was good. Cause I think that my, who I was or who I am, you know, kind of was seen. I, I mean, my real, my true heart, I guess was exposed. So. Yeah. So well, it was I just thought it was great because you were very emotional, like very sad about it at the beginning. And then when you got to the pit stop, like, by the way, why did it take you so long to find all that stuff? Because I, 
I think if I'm not mistaken, looking at the departure times, you were only like a minute ahead of Rob and Amber and Ron. Which and time? Yeah, which time? Like when you finish the fast forward or whatever, and he's like, you're team number one. And I looked at the departure time the next episode and it was like, you try to enjoy 11.26 p.m., Rob and Amber, like 11.28 or something like that. I'm like, how are they only two minutes ahead of these people? But I'm telling I- you, we had problems with direction. <laughs> Finding things was not our strong suit. It was not our, su- our strong suit there. We, I mean, we seem to have um, strength in other areas. Um, but finding things and that self-doubt, that self-talk and just constantly going, okay, this can't be right. You know, a lot of going in circles that just, that hurt us a lot uh, in more instances than I knew, but, um, you know, something just still came through. Like, obviously it was meant to be because we still figured out to, how to get to the right place at the right time. Yeah, so after I found it, I really found it uh, pretty awesome how you, well, first you finish first, which is always great because you get a prize and everybody loves prizes. But I just found it great that you were like really like sad about it in the beginning and then you were almost laughing about it. Like, I don't know if you're still sad, but just to see that turnaround was really cool. But yeah. then going into the next leg, you have, you have momentum, Meredith and Gretchen survive, which I bet you're probably happy about. Yeah. Uh, talk to me about. Um, you talk about how they were like really sweet and like good friends of yours. Did that bond happen initially? And then when you uh, solidified that alliance, how satisfying was it to get the early flight to Istanbul, Turkey, when Boston Rob was really just making, trying to make fun of you and uh, Meredith and Gretchen of like, oh, did you get the early flight to Istanbul or whatever? And he was being sarcastic, but it actually bit him in the ass. So (laughs) how satisfying was it to just... Uh, maybe just talk about your relationship with them and then how satisfying was it to get to get an early flight to mm-hmm. Istanbul uh, and get that huge lead? Well, um, like I said, we, we fa- uh, formed a bond with Meredith and Gretchen very early on. I mean, they were the oldest, but we were the second oldest. So I think we related to them a lot. We weren't the, we, we were athletic, but not really, not that much more, um, but um, we related to the, them a lot on their theory on, on life. And so they were, you know, they're just good people and they didn't get involved in all of the, the backstabbing stuff and, you know, the things that the other teams do and, and always going, oh my God, they're coming, you know. At some point, I think we had the thought that, you know, just like life, you know, you run your own race in your own life. You don't, you can't worry about what other people are doing because the minute you do, you see what happens. So sometimes you run, you do your own thing and what's supposed to happen for you happens. But when you're trying to blaze or follow somebody else's trail, it doesn't work out for you. So, you know, some people like Robin Ember, they like to, you know, they like to challenge people. They like to put other people down and they like to, um, they're, they're always worried about what other people were doing and thinking. And so I, you know, it was nice that we finally would get a lead and be able to do something right. <laughs> but um, yeah, we loved working all the time alongside with Meredith and Gretchen. And um, I was surprised more than anything that, you know, they were never fast, but they were always right there. Yeah. They were always right there. And I thought, man, there's something to be said about just, slowing down, doing your own thing, thinking clearly about what you want to do. Because most of the time, all the teams would be running fast in a direction that nobody knew where they were going, but no one wanted to be left behind. And so at one point, I think we just stopped doing that. Yeah. So So how nice was it to have that lead and maybe not be as, I mean, you're obviously panicked on the amazing race because you never know what can happen, but how Mm -hmm. nice is it to have that lead and then after you find the gnome and you get to do, get to, he gets to be your third passenger, 
how um cool i mean obviously you didn't do this roadblock but how cool is it just going up to that castle and kind of seeing your husband at the time kind of storm up the castle like <laughs> i guess you would say like a knight in shining armor or whatever you want to yes. call it and you're just waiting out there and just like chilling and you have to like read a book or whatever and then you get to the, top <laughs> of the castle and the pit stop so just from maybe like a scenic point of view and like, yeah. just like having that lead how like cool was that you know what, Turkey is absolutely beautiful. It was so beautiful and that castle was gorgeous and I was so thankful that I didn't choose to do that castle, you know, climb because boy, we would have been in trouble. So I was glad that he did it and I was very proud of him. And it was like a, my night is, you know, riding up the sides of the castle to come and rescue me. But um, it was it was great and it was really nice to be able to have that breathing room it's always nice when you're in the head of the pack for a change you know we changed our tune way back i think the head shaving uh along just along the way i think i started like i said forgetting about me being so self-conscious about everything and and thinking and doubting what i could do and just deciding deciding to do things that i didn't think i could so so that was great it was nice to be in, in the lead for a change but yeah. you know, we came in first that time. We had the gnome, but we didn't win anything. Yeah, I was gonna just ask that. Like, how annoyed were you not to get like a prize? Like, I mean, like, first of all, I think Debbie and Bianca's prize when they won the first leg was the best because you had to pay taxes on traveling, which I didn't realize that until talking to actually some teams who had won legs. But that you pay taxes on what? Yeah, you have to pay taxes on these sponsored trips. I'm like, why do you have to pay taxes on something that's sponsored? So I was like, that's kind of <laughs> Because it's a gift. Yeah. Yeah. But right. um, no. Um, yeah, that was very annoying because um, up to that point, we never won anything. You didn't win anything for the other leg? No. No. I love socks. No, I don't think. I felt like it felt like not every leg was was a prize and now they do it every first leg every first place but um on our show you know when we came in first we didn't get anything so and that time we came in first i thought for sure and we have this gnome and they're like oh does it have the plane on the bottom it's like no they're like what what yeah yeah and of course the couple that's not going to be a couple after the race gets it so that's yeah um, yeah that right i know um, it would have been nice yeah. but yeah we didn't, we didn't that's get that pretty um ironic so you get to the final four um you got to be feeling good at this point ron and kelly have no no money rob and amber are probably a little bit shooken up that you kind of have your groove what was the deal with getting the flights in that next leg because obviously there was a connecting flight and I talked to Joe and Bill and obviously in season one, you couldn't change tickets and you could change tickets in your season. So mm -hmm. like, did you guys just not notice that or were you just tired or what was maybe the. Which part, which part? That was, that was when you were going to London. So you guys uh -huh. had the direct flight and then Ron and Kelly and Robin Amber got one like for Frankfurt that landed in like two hours, like before yours or whatever. And yeah took like a direct flight and it was like two hours later geez i don't even remember us being that far behind but it just goes to show you we still oh is that when we got no was that that was after was that after jamaica no. that was in london so that was like when you're going to london and you had to go in the little ferris wheel and find the clue and then do this mm -hmm. thing post or whatever which i'll ask after this question but was that just like an error of judgment you think or were you just like this is only I know, and you know what I don't even it's funny I need to watch the show again it's been so long yeah. but I don't remember now what that was what happened or why but obviously it didn't make a difference yeah well so how <laughs> cool is it going in that little ferris wheel and trying to find the clue like a where's waldo kind of thing because that kind of looked cool as far as like going in the wheel and then how annoyed were you um how hard was that uh, you had to like lift all those boats and stuff like that? That looked pretty strenuous. So you know, I'm telling you every challenge that they give you on that race, it is 
a challenge. It's not easy. And so, and that one was no less, but those boats were heavy. They were extremely heavy. And um, I was just glad that I didn't have another girl with me at that time because that would be hard because I don't know, I guess we would be struggling together, but it was nice having someone that can kind of manhandle those boats, but those boats were, were extremely heavy. And, um, and I think um, he even helped Meredith and Gretchen with their yeah. boats, which was, you know, which is nice. Cause you know, he, we felt for them all the time and he's like, you know, we, we, we got to help them out. And I thought, all right, you know, we, we, it's, it's, it's nice to be a good human at times, you know, and like I said, if it, if it's for you, sometimes it's going to happen, but you know, it didn't take away from us, uh, you know, in the end. So, so it was nice being able to help our friends out, but, um, but yeah, all those challenges are tough and they, they, I mean, they don't show you how long we're doing those challenges most of the time, but we're pushing boats for, you know, over an hour. Yeah. So, so before you finish um, that leg, you have to drive this big red bus. So how bad was that? Because everybody looked frustrated. You and Meredith looked like she wanted to like throw something at production's head. So like, <laughs> how, how stressful was that? Because so oh, the most stressful, I think, was, first of all, what I didn't know was that there was a camera inside of the the, the the bus that was that was one thing and i thought i was by myself so i'm thinking i'm having my own thoughts and i'm freaking out and pissed about how difficult this is all to myself is what i thought but i was wrong um but uh the most stressful part once again was my husband trying to steer me he's like just follow my lead just follow my hands he's doing this with the truck and i'm going and I'm going, I know how to drive. If I look at you, I keep hitting these cones. So as soon as I told him, just let me do it, I managed it myself. But it was definitely difficult driving that big old bus. But I made it. Once he got out of the way, I think I was just determined at that point. I thought, once again, I can do this on my own. So I did. But it was frustrating. Everybody was frustrated because the, the margins of error were tiny. Oh, I, I, yeah, that's awesome. I forgot. So before you get to London, how cool was it seeing like the whirling dervish temple things? It looked like, it looked like something almost out of a movie with like the smoky fog and like, yeah, like, cool little dancer things. Like I was, I know like, it was so that? cool because they don't, I don't think they practice that much anymore, but it was just cool. Cause I've heard of it before and I've seen the outfits, but I've never seen it in action. And, just seeing that, I mean, that's the, that's the beauty of, of beyond this race. You know, so many cool things you get to see half the time you're racing and you don't even get to really experience these things, but that was very cool. So I'm glad they threw that in and that was a big thing in Turkey. So I loved it. It was gorgeous. Yeah. So I was going to ask this for my all-star question, but I guess I can ask this now. So how disappointing was it not seeing Meredith and Gretchen on All-Stars? Because I heard that they were asked, but for some strange reason, they declined and they were replaced really? by Terry and Ian. I'm no, not sure. I didn't know that. that. I wish they would have been on there. That would have been really cool. They're, um, they, I stay somewhat in touch with them now. And they I want to say it was someone's 80th birthday or I don't know. They're, they're just getting up there in age. So I wonder, though, what happened. That would have been really nice to be able to see them again. Whatever. Yeah, I would love to interview them. So if you have their contact information, it'd be great to interview them. I do, I do. I'll share it with you. Yeah, but yeah. Uh, so you get to the final three. What are you thinking? You got a one in three shot of William Bucks. Uh, maybe just uh, take me through the mindset of that and then take me through the mindset because this was really weird because I hadn't done this in a while. I think as far as I'm concerned, how they had the final three teams and they had didn't that the final leg was not straight away. It was like another leg after that, which I don't think they had done that since like season two or something like that. So maybe just take your, take me through the mindset of going to Jamaica first, because if I had to guess, you're probably thinking that this is the final leg. So mm -hmm. what was your mindset going into that leg first? Well, um, Jamaica is where um, we really had a lot of challenges. Um, 
we were going and when we were going to the pit stop, we were thinking, okay, this there's only at that time, I think there was four teams. And I thought this is going to definitely um, determine the last three. And so we were in the lead clearly. And of all things, I don't remember if they showed this, but we got a flat tire. Yeah, they did. That was the reason why I was going to ask that. Like, so how cool is it getting to Jamaica and like doing the limbo and you're kind of having a fun time on the beach and you're chilling yeah. out and then you have the lead. So maybe yeah. how fun was the beach part of it? And just like, it kind of like, I mean, you're stressed out, but it looked relaxing. And then it was, how it was fun. It was fun up until that doggone flat tire. Um, the cab driver, as many cab drivers on different shows, um, basically they are not really prepared and sometimes they don't have gas because they don't have the money until somebody pays them for a ride um, and they stop. But this guy, when we got the flat tire, we said, do you have a spare? And he said, I don't know. And we were like, what do you mean you don't know? And he says, it's not my car. It's my friend's car I borrowed. And so we weren't sure if we were ever going to get out of there, but we found a a tire underneath the car and um, my husband had to change the tire right there. And of course we saw the teams fly past. And when they flew past, we thought, oh my God, we're out. We're out of this. We're totally out of the race. And we get to the pit stop and I think it was a non-elimination. Yeah. Think, right. It was oh, a non-elimination. And we thought, are you kidding me? It was a non-elimination. So it was like one more miracle, you know, that we've been uh, blessed with. And, um, but at the time on our show, um, I don't know if they still do this, but they took, they take all of our money. They took our clothes. They don't do it anymore. Thank God. They took our clothes. They took our money. They took everything. And by then, because we had run out of money on the very first show, we had been stockpiling, you know, and saving and we had tons of cash. And so when they took the money, I thought, Oh my God. Oh my God. Um, we're going to, we're just, we just don't have any money. And so we get to the, we, we figured out that, okay, uh, we should have saved some money. I would, I wanted to cheat at that time. I really did. I wish I would have, I thought, of, I thought, what if we would have kept some of the cash so we could have, you know, case with the non-elimination, we would have had some money to get out of here, but we had nothing. And they gave us a plastic baggie with our passport and our medication. That's the only thing they gave us. And up in that day is when we had to, um, oh no, was it that day? No. Yeah, that day we had to build a raft on the side of the river in Jamaica and it was very muddy. And I just remember thinking, I'm completely covered in mud. We had to build this raft and we had to take it to the other side and climb up this muddy hill. So I was completely dirty. So when we got to the pit stop and they'd taken all of our clothes, I was dirty, didn't have any soap, but we were at a nice place. So I got to clean up, but I had to put back on the same exact dirty clothes. So it was horrible. And I just thought, oh my God, how are we going to get out of this? And our, I think we are, uh, you know, they always have you leave 12 hours later. So our, our departure time was going to be at two in the morning. Oh God. And that was even worse because all the other teams that had come in ahead of us, they were able to call a cab, you know, have them pick them up and they had the money to pay them. And we couldn't call a cab because we, even, we tried to call a cab. We thought maybe if we get someone here, we can appeal to them and yeah. maybe they bill for us. But we tried it. We went to the office of the hotel. We tried to call a cab driver and they said, Oh, the cab drivers aren't working until eight in the morning. And we thought, Oh, we can't wait till eight in the morning. It's two right now. And they're like, well, everybody's sleep right now. And they don't do 24 hours like they do here. Yeah. So we thought, what can we do? And I literally thought this is it. We're dead. We're dead in the water. We can't call anybody. Nobody will pick us up. Um, and, and we thought, well, maybe if we go to the part of the hotel where there's some tourists, maybe they're partying. 
but they said, oh, all the clubs are closed now. It's two o'clock. And, you know, by the time we left and started thinking this, things were closing down and people were already gone back to their rooms. And so there were no tourists out. And we were, I thought about what are, what could we legally do to get out of here? Cause we needed to continue going. I was going to call the police. I was going to call the fire department. I didn't know what to do. So we decided to start walking and we thought, and you're not allowed to hitchhike either because, you know, of course they don't want you to get into uh, the wrong hands in a third world country. And so we walk out to the gate and we thought maybe we'll flag a cab down or somebody, if we saw somebody riding by and this cab driver just happened to stop. And he said, I saw, I saw you waving. He says, but I will tell you that most cab drivers won't pick people up on the side of the road because this is how they get carjacked. So he says, normally nobody will pick you up. He says, but I decided to pick you up because I saw the camera. And so he says, well, what are you doing? And so we, we told this guy we wanted to maybe go to the airport um, because we needed to go where there were tourists so we can go and beg for money somewhere. And so he says, um, I can take you part of the way. And he says, uh, but I, I have to go and pick up my sister because I'm off duty. So he took us part way, took us into town and dropped us off in the middle of town. And he said, the airport is about two miles that way. Just keep walking. So we're walking down the streets at like three in the morning and um, people are swirling around us and going, what are you doing? What's going on? And it was really kind of frightening, you know, and I just thought then, oh my God, we're not going to make it through this. We finally get to the airport only to find out the airport opened at five in the morning. So there, we had to stay outside until the airport opened. And then we, we really thought we were out of the race at this point. We thought we'd blown it. So it was terrifying. Yeah. I mean, like what it will... First of all, you get to the pit stop, and I assume you're thinking uh, on the non elimination. I assume you're thinking, okay, there's going to be a bunch of people. They're going to be celebrating. Like you're like, oh my god, we're in first place, and this flat yeah. tire. Uh, that must have been awful. But did you guys notice when Rob and Amber got pulled by police, or were you ahead of them at that point? Because that was pretty funny. No, we were ahead of them. Oh my gosh. No, I don't remember that. That's so funny. But I loved any time something like that happened to them because they, you know, it always seemed like nothing bad happens to them, only to us. So, but yeah, we were ahead of them. Um, we were very close to the pit stop when the flat tire happened. Just enough to have everybody go ahead of us. Yeah. So. Yeah, it was, it, it was, it was such a letdown. And at that point, I really felt like, you know, I've given up because we're totally out of this. I had no more faith or hope that this was going to happen. But I do remember, though, the next day thinking, you know, we, we're still here. They didn't tell us to stop because we kept, I kept saying, well, maybe we're too far behind everyone. You know, we were, we we're a good bit behind everybody. You were an um, entire country behind people in the last leg. Yeah, we were. And so I just thought, you know, but how come nobody's telling us to, to stop? No one told us to stop. And so we just, we just kind of moseyed around. And I remember um, when we got to the airport, that's when we had to beg. We started begging and we tried to appeal to a group of um tourists and travelers and they said are you guys doing an, a reality thing we we're like yeah and they were like we don't do reality and I'd so like, then the, the whole group turned their backs on us and we were like oh my god this is so embarrassing it's humiliating enough to have to beg so mind you i was bald i was completely dirty i had mud on me and i just felt like we looked like bums, like we, you know, we, we're from Jamaica, we're bums, we're in the airport begging, and nobody wanted to help us, and, and people would throw coins at us, Jamaican coins, I remember them being maybe 28 Jamaican coins to one dollar, and we would get coins, so by the, by the time we were, probably after three hours of begging, we probably had maybe a dollar 
or so. And, and the, the task was to drive to Negril. And when we got to Negril, I think we had to go to this restaurant and peel onions. Yeah. So we, were, we were already a good two or four hours from the grill and we had to figure out how to get there. So that was, it was just morally destroying, you know, because you're thinking, oh my gosh, how are we going to do this? And we were trying to, I finally decided to try to talk a cab driver into helping us and they would say, oh, that's a good, um, that's a good distance. It's going to be about $250. What on and, earth? Yeah. <laughs> And I thought, are you kidding? I have like $5. And so I remember these, this American woman, she says, I can give you 20 and my, my buddy can give you 20. So we had $40 and we offered this cab driver. We said, all we have is, is $40, but we need to go to the grill. And he says, he says, I'll take you. He was a godsend. Yeah. So he took us and he waited for us and took us, we, we chopped 50 pounds of onions. So now we're dirty and stinky. We smell like onions because we didn't have any soap or water or anything to clean ourselves with because they had taken all of our clothes and our bags and our, you know, toiletries. And, um, and after we cut the onions, it said to fly to, I think, Puerto Rico. Yeah. So the guy brought us back to the airport, which was incredible full round trip, which would have been a fortune uh, for $40. And, you know, we just thanked him profusely. But um, the other challenge was um, we had to get on a plane and we smelt and we stunk and we we're dirty and people were, people judge as they do, as we do. Yeah. And um, nobody wanted to sit next to me on the plane. People were complaining about how I smelled. So it was really bad because, you know, bald and stinky. So I thought, man, I have a job. I have a tub. I normally don't smell like this. I don't normally look this way, but you know, you can't explain, you know, your story to people. And, and it's just su such a weird thing to have to humble yourself in the beginning, the, to bag. So I was the most humbled by the end of that, that whole race, because we were begging from people and, you know, no one had to give us anything, but it was really on through the kindness of people that kind of compelled us. Yeah. So, well, I kind of want to bring it back to the raft because what's that feeling like when you get to the raft roadblock and you've obviously had to do with boats, but were you like, come on to production? Because Rob and Amber did this challenge in Survivor and they won it. Are you like, yeah. come on, why are you giving the all American couple that everybody loves that other million dollars? Like, are you like, <laughs> I'm telling you, I didn't, could not care less at that time what Rob and Amber were doing. Because once I got, like you said, you know, what got us into that groove, I think we stopped thinking about what everybody else was doing. You know, we stopped worrying about what Rob and Amber were doing. And, and I thought, you know what, they're probably ahead of us, but we're still in it. So, but yeah, that, that whole thing, it, there was a theme and it seemed like there was water, there were boats. And I thought this can't be all for my bad benefit, you know, cause just because I'm afraid of uh, swimming or, and I'm not being good on boats, I'm not good on horses, all these things. It couldn't have just been for me. <laughs> to have the worst time ever but it felt like it it definitely felt like it yeah it was like you unfortunately had the worst time ever and Robert and Amber had the best time ever well until you I know I, did not, I was going this is so hard I never had so many tears and you know I never cried so much I never felt so humiliated humbled and and excited all at the same token well so. maybe you just talk to me about like you obviously said that you like uh, let go of this wall of like just like caring how you looked and all this other stuff. Maybe just talk about the emotional and uh, perseverance that you had to get through uh, even the beginning of that leg when like you're at the airport, you're breaking down, you're mm -hmm. tired. It's the last leg. You know it's a million dollars. And what yeah. people don't realize is there's a huge difference between first and second. I think it's a million dollars, so only like 25,000 or whatever. Um, and so Maybe just talk about that, like how you had that perseverance to pull through. And then after you get to Jamaica, to Puerto Rico, 
how thrilled were you when you saw that hotel close and open until the morning or didn't mm -hmm. open until the morning? Oh yeah. Um, when we got to Puerto Rico, oh my God. So we already, we already had the attitude that, you know, we're out of this, we lost and, but why isn't anyone telling us to quit? But we kept saying, well, nobody's telling us to stop. So should we, even though we knew we were probably hours behind because people were already there in Puerto Rico. But what we didn't know was that when people got to Puerto Rico, the next um, challenge was to go to this, um, it was a, an abandoned, like I want to say a, a mine or something or a pineapple mine, or I don't, I forget what it was. But we thought we'll just go through the motions and until someone tells us to quit. But we didn't want to just stop on our own because no one said to quit. And so I thought in my mind, you know, until someone says, you know, or the fat lady sings, we got to keep going. So we moved along, but we moved kind of slow. But when we got to Puerto Rico, I remember doing a prayer. I really did. And I, and I just said, you know, if there's any way that this is supposed to be my time or or my turn to win this thing and to prove beyond a shadow of a doubt and beyond all of the doubters and and everything else that we've gone through you know i just thought it, it's if i if i saw one of those contestants i said then this is my race to have and i even though i thought it was impossible when we got to the place where the challenge was supposed to happen it was already late at night and and the place was obviously closed and i remember seeing a car that was um an amazing race car it looked like ours yeah i thought are you kidding me are you freaking kidding me somebody's is no but no one was in the car and then we walk over to the car and they were asleep yeah it's ron and Kelly. down and i thought you gotta be kidding me that was um kelly and ron and then um, we knocked on the window and woke them up and we're like, and they were like, where have you been? And we were like, oh. In another country. <laughs> we have been through hell. So, but I'm so happy to see you guys. And oh my God, the life that just came back to us. We just had life again. Cause I thought, are you kidding me? When this place opens, I am going to run like hell like i've never run before and it, because they told us rob and amber were there too and we were like are you kidding they said that uh rob and amber had gone to a hotel of course because they had money yeah. and they had friends and so they stayed in a hotel and we thought oh my god we there is still a chance and i and, I, and when the gate opened the next morning at seven i, I remember running faster than i'd ever run and my husband said, he said, he said, you look like one of those kids when they're first learning to run, you, you think they're going to hurt themselves and you're kind of trying to hold them like, oh my God, I've never seen your legs move that fast, faster than you know how fast you can go. And I just thought, I have, I have now got flight infused in me. I'm Wonder Woman. I'm everything because now these guys are here and we have a chance. Are you kidding? So yeah, we came back to life that day. It was amazing. Yeah, well, you probably were like, thank the heavens for Puerto Rican traffic. Because I think if I'm not mistaken, Rob and Amber got there around 12, like noon, and the thing closed at like four, and they were just stuck in traffic for hours. And they, I think Ooh. they got there like, I don't think they got there too far, uh, what do you call it? Before, like too far before it closed or after it closed or whatever the saying oh, Thank is. goodness. But, yeah. Traffic sucks there, <laughs> but yeah, yeah. our lucky break. Like I said, if it's meant for you sometimes, you know what, no matter what, some miracle is going to happen and it's going to happen for you. But um, when we when we left that um, mill after Tina jumped off of that platform and jumped into the ocean, another thing I thought, oh my God, I would die. Oh, God, I'm not doing that. Water. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I can't swim. So he did that. He did it really fast and we left and we were reminded that we could not speed. And as we're on the, on the freeway doing the speed limit, we see Rob and Amber fly past us. And I thought, are you, what about that? 
And they said, just worry about your own thing. So we get to the airport, Rob and Amber had already gotten their um, tickets and we get in line right behind and they had just left. And we said, we want the exact same tickets that they had. And the lady said, okay. And we said, is there anything earlier? And she said, absolutely not. We're like, absolutely nothing. And she said, no. And I remember thinking the flight was going to be like two hours from then. And so I remember thinking I wanted to try to clean up somehow. <laughs> so I'm walking around the airport trying to find some free soap or stuff to clean up a little bit. And, and my husband was like, you know, there looks like a flight that's boarding right now. He says, there's a flight boarding. He goes, and if, and I don't see Robin Amber anywhere, what do you bet they're probably getting on that flight? And I said, Gary. Really? So he goes, he goes, let's go check it out. So we run over there to the gate, go check it out. And they are literally just closing the door on this gate. And we said, did another team with the guy with the red hat and cameras just come through? And, sh and the lady at the gate said, yeah, they just walked in. And I'm like, no way. So then at that very moment, the lady who sold us the ticket came down from the uh, ramp because she just walked ramp, uh, Robin Amber on the plane and she's now closing the door. And we said, hey, you told us there were no other flights. She said, well, normally you have to have a certain amount of time between, you know, to be able to get to the flight. And I, and I said, we, we were like, but you just walked Robin Amber on the plane. So you lied to us. So probably Rob told her to, but she oh. lied to us. And then she had just walked them on because the plane was still sitting there. And then we were like, well, we want to get on there too. She goes, well, it's not up to me. She goes, I have to call the, the pilot because if he's getting ready to take off. So she asked the pilot and he says, we're just sitting here. We haven't started to even get ready to go. So they made it look a lot more dramatic than it was, but we were like a minute behind Robin oh, yeah. Amber getting on that plane. Like 30, it seemed like it looked like, like a half an hour. Because <laughs> I, I know people were like the plane took off and it came back and picked yeah. you up. No, we were, we were literally right behind Robin Amber because we were keeping our eyes on them. And we looked around and we were going, okay, we don't see them anywhere. And that lady walked them on the plane. And my husband was like, okay, this is, this is wrong because you told us there weren't any other flights. We went on to just like them. And they were like, we're just sitting here. So they just opened the door and we walked on. Rob and Amber's face just dropped, but oh. it was amazing. Well, whose face would it drop? I would be pissed. I would be like, what the heck? Yeah, but, uh, but you know what? Rob and Amber did that to us on another flight when we were in Chile, I think. Um, we were all boarded up. They'd taken the gate away, and, and we see Rob and Amber walking on the tarmac, and we were like, no, no, don't let him on, don't let him on. They opened the door, put the gate, the little step ladder back, and they, they came on, and we were like, wow. How did they do that? So that happens more than you think, and especially if they're not ready to leave right away, they'll do it, but it's not like the plane left at all. Yeah, thanks. I'll for tell you that the, that the airline owes him money because he said that they made us win, but you know, the reality is those people would be sued. They would be in trouble if they tried to help a reality show just for their, you know, to save to save the place of Robin Amber. Yeah, so. well, they got an extra million anyway, so I bet he's that's right complaining about it now. But uh, yeah, <laughs> so yeah, thanks for clearing that up because when I watched it, I was like, I wasn't like, I wasn't like no disrespect to you guys or no disrespect to anyone, but I was like, did production have something to do with that? Because I was like, no. why? I was like, yeah, they 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 had nothing to do with it. They were nowhere involved. They were nowhere around. We just decided to do exactly what Robin Amber had done, and that lady told she must have told him that that plane was was about to take off, and only if they could make it over there before the doors closed, and they did. And then she walks from the ramp, like she walked them on there. And we were like, um we deserve the same because you just, because we were literally just a minute behind them. 
So it wasn't like they turned anything around or they stopped, you know, it, it, they were sitting there. So it was perfect. Yeah. So in Miami, you really didn't do anything other than finding destinations. But what was it like when you're literally at the finish line? I don't know if you knew that you were in first place at that point, but you're at the finish line. You're essentially steps away from winning a million dollars. People are saying prayers, like hoping you win and stuff like that. And then you have to beg the taxi to just give you to give him like 20 bucks where you like, I will give you $5,000 my winnings if you just let me go. Like how stressful was that? And then you had this random guy in the street where it's like begging isn't the way to go for it. But it's like, what do you expect me to do? So maybe just take me through that moment of, yeah, holy shit, a million dollars could be slipping from our fingers. Yeah. Well, and just to back up a little on that, that surprise flight to uh, Robin Amber, that we made, we ended up sitting in the back of the plane because that's where the seats were and they were in the front. Well, we were broke then because we had our, remember we only had $40 that we gave to the cab driver in Jamaica and we didn't have any money. And so um, we were telling the people on the plane that, you know, we really need to, we need some cash because we're gonna need to, um, take a cab. And um, so this flight attendant comes by and she goes, are you trying to raise money? And we're like, yeah, she goes, oh, honey, she goes, I'm going to help you out. So she goes around and she's asking for money and she gets money for us and brings it to us. And then what we realized is that she said the whole front of the plane, Rob and Amber had already got money from everybody. Oh, their- I, wonder if she, I wonder if she asked Rob and Amber and I would have, I wonder if she asked them. She went up to the front and they were like, oh, we gave some money to those people. We already, you know, we already basically, it's almost like the plane was divided and they took sides. Like the back half was, helped us out. The front half was all Robin Amber's folks. And so when we got to the, when we landed and they opened the door, everybody in the front parted the ways, let Robin Amber get off the plane. And we ran up there because our people in the back were like, Go, go, go. And what, did they try to block you the front or something like that? They blocked us in the front. So we get out to the front. We have to now get a cab. And we're thinking, oh, my gosh, we got to get a cab really fast. We got this cab driver. And the clue said to go to this um, cigar store. It was a cigar store, but I forget. I want to say it's like three, um, I don't know, just say three amigos. Whatever it was, it was in Spanish or the name of it. The name of it was regular, but what we did know was that the place we were looking for was a Spanish name. Cause they didn't, you know, that was a twist that was really hard. And I thought that was really rude of CBS to do that. That was, that was a mean one because, you know, we would have never guessed that we're looking for some place with a Spanish name. So we're asking the cab driver, do you know where the three amigos were, is or whatever? And he goes, no, he says, I don't know, but I'll call some of my friends and the area that we needed to go. He says, you know, um, if it's a cigar place, he says, uh, my friends said there's a place in this area, but it's called something in Spanish, right? Trace, whatever. And and we were like, we don't know what it, you know, it could be. So let's just go there because we don't know where else to go this guy just happened to speak Spanish that drove us. So we go to this place and it just happened to be the place. And when we go in and we, we get the, we get the clue and everything, we have no idea where Rob and Amber are. Of course, when we watch the show, we're, we're watching them trolling people. Where is this place? Where is, show me where this is. Somebody has to know, you know, we had no idea they were having trouble. That's because the name wasn't in English. And the luck of the luck of the of of the universe was in our favor because the guy who helped us spoke Spanish. He's like, well, if you translate that, this is the name of the place. So that put us in the lead, but we didn't know it. We thought for sure they were way ahead of us already. They'd gone way ahead, gotten their cab, and they're already on it. So we thought we were behind. And so we get to the finish line. Or even before then, I remember telling the cab driver as the meter's ticking, I'm going, oh my God, we only have this much money. <laughs> Once again, here we go. We only have this much money. And, uh, 
And I thought, I don't know if we should tell him or if that's rude. So when I told him, the guy just kind of went off. He says, you know, I don't do this for fun. I have a family, you know, so I make my living. You guys are trying to trick me. And we were like, no, 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 we're not tricking you. You know, we're really sorry, um, but we'll get your money for you. He goes, how? We're like, you know, my husband offered his wedding ring and I thought, oh my God. The guy says, I don't need a ring, I need cash. So when we got to the fin to the pit, to the finish line, we were thinking this is a, a dead end street and either we can try to beg and get some money here um, because at the very least, either we're last already and everybody's inside or if we see somebody coming, we can run. So we stood out there and decided to just beg. And every time we get some money, we give it to the guy and says, is this enough? He says, no, I need more. I need more. So this lady that lived in the building, this little old lady, she was so kind. She came down and she says, what are you raising funds for? And we were like, well, we don't have enough to pay for our cab. And so she gave us the cash and which was amazing. And so we gave it to the, the cab driver and we were like, is that enough? He says, yes, this is fine. And that's why that's we were like, we're not going to leave this guy, especially when he feels like we did him wrong. You know, that was we had never played the game that way up to that point, And we didn't want to finish it that way. So when we ran in, we really had no idea what place we were in because we thought for sure Rob and Amber were in there. We thought for sure and we got in there and we thought and everybody's going shaking their heads, nodding like, yeah, and we're thinking us really you know it was it was a shock because of all the crap we went through all the headaches all the roadblocks challenges and no money and all it was just amazing it was meant to be so there's yeah. no other way around it but so what is i mean i've i've been i've actually interviewed alex from season two who won so how glad were you that it wasn't a foot race and you have to run a giant hill like they did where it was like two miles and then what is that feeling like when you win a million dollars and you just get to cross the finish line and the culmination yeah. of like traveling for a month and everything yes. you've been through? Not that it wouldn't pay off if you didn't win because you go through this great experience, but you yeah. just get a million dollars on top of it, yeah. which is like the cherry on top. So what is Ooh. that feeling like of winning? You know, um, at first it felt unreal. And then I remember thinking, wow you know, Rob and Amber are really not here. I think we're really going to win this. And what does that mean? And I just remember thinking, I don't know if I've ever celebrated something like that. And I, and I really thought to myself at the time I was thinking, I don't even know what, how do you celebrate that? How does that feel? And I'm literally standing there going, and I'm thinking to myself, and then all of a sudden I just screamed because I thought, are you kidding me? This could really pay some bills. So <laughs> that's the first thing I thought of. And, and after I thought of that, I really thought about, you know, adoption or in vitro, all these bills and things that, you know, cost us money and things that have put us behind in life. And I thought, man, our life is going to change in a good way. Not that we're going to be rich, but we're going to be able to pay some past bills and, you know, and help our family just a little bit. And, and, and boy, do I want to eat and have some water. <laughs> That's all I thought about. I was so desperately hungry and thirsty at that point. And it was the funniest thing because, you know, we had to wait until everybody had come through, Rob and Amber, Ron and um, Kelly, and we had to go through everything before they let us have water, eat or anything. And, and that, at that point, that's all I cared about. I wanted to eat. I just thought, just please give me some water or something. But it was an incredible feeling. It was just very um, freeing. It was just the most amazing thing ever because, you know, we came from way behind, least likely to, to exceed. Um, I remember think, uh, hearing one of the um, production people, they said, you guys look like the least likely ever to win we thought you guys were going to be out long ago and we we thought so too but you know we really did have this this thought that no matter what until they tell us to go we're still in it just keep 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 going for it and it and you know and that's really hard sometimes because you're tired 
you, you, you don't have any more hope or faith that it can happen. And it was amazing that it was just meant to be. So under all miracles or, or impossibilities, I mean, it, it happens. So I'm just so thrilled. And that just sets the tone for, you know, anything going forward. You can really do anything you set your mind to. So I just, yeah. I just came away thinking, never quit, never give up. Yeah, that's awesome. Going into All Stars, were you excited to get the call? Were you shocked? Yeah, um, no, I was excited to get the call. Um, I was more shocked that they we were the only winners. Yeah, I was going to ask that question. How annoyed were you? Were you that you were the only winners? And how glad were you that it wasn't Survivor and that they couldn't vote you out? <laughs> Well, you know what? The other thing, the thing about being the only winners, though, is everybody felt like we didn't deserve to be on there. They said, you already won. You don't need to win again. And obviously we didn't, but they said, you don't need to win again. And I thought, you know, this was a, such a thrill and such a life changing thing that I, why wouldn't I do it again? Yeah. But um why shouldn't I get another th a million dollars? But yeah, a lot of people were, were, you know, I felt like if there were other winners, then they would, we would be completely um, being challenged by someone on the same level, I guess. But, you know, the, I mean, even though those guys were desperate to get us out, I mean, they were working yeah. together in some, in some instances working uh, against us. We didn't have as many friends on that one. You never know. You could always return for a champion's edition. That's got to happen sooner or later. Yeah, but, uh, I, I would totally do it. But so who were you shocked to see? And then who were you like maybe like disappointed not to see? Obviously, you mentioned Meredith and Gretchen, but was there anyone that you were really shocked to see or disappointed not to see? Um. There were so many people that I that I just loved over the years, um, but um, I, I I was shocked to see the the Myrna and Sharna. What's her name? Charlotte. Yeah, Charlotte and, Mir Charla and Myrna, or as they were affectionately known, Myrna and Smyrna. Myrna and Smyrna. I, I didn't want to say that because I thought I don't think that's her name. Yeah, I was shocked to see them. Um, and who else? I was. There were a few people that I remember thinking, oh, I don't, I don't remember, I don't recall them. So I don't know how they decided to pick people. Did you, have you figured that out? You probably know uh, more than me. I know the alternates if you want to know who the alternates are. I were. do. Okay, so Chris and John from season six, they were like runners up. They were like, uh, you, they had like the couple fighting Jonathan and Victoria, and then you had like the good couple, Chris and John. So okay, and uh -huh. fighting. Um, Ken and Gerard from season three, the okay. kind of brothers. Yeah. Uh, instead of Eric and Danielle. Yeah, it, that was an odd yeah, chip. They choice. wanted it to be like a Robin Amber love story, but Eric and Danielle weren't even dating at the time. Uh, mm -hmm. It was originally supposed to be Flo, the winner of season three, and she was dating one of the twin models at the time. So ah. they were supposed to be a team. Uh, Meredith and Gretchen obviously declined. And wow. I oh, and then Frank and Margarita, who finished uh, runner up in season uh -huh. one, were asked, but he didn't want to do it. Okay. Because they were uh, married to someone else and then yeah. I think there was one more I can look it up really quick hmm. but uh yeah there were, research there were like a lot of teams that personally I was shocked that Jonathan and Victoria weren't asked back on yeah oh and yeah that's them too but they maybe because they they were divorced but even then you know I would still I would still run with each other again you know even though we're divorced I don't think that would stop me though oh and then the other ones were chip and kim were annoyed that they weren't asked back yeah they were really sad um, that they weren't bj and tyler uh mm -hmm. robin brennan um and then lynn and alec shockingly from your season were considered so maybe, i love those guys yeah so i mean they're obviously married now i think so yeah would would you would have 
would you have liked to run with them? And then the last team that was asked was, um, oh, there was Linda and Karen, the bowling moms. Uh, okay. Colin, yeah. Colin and I would Colin. have loved to run with Lynn and Alex. That would have been fun. And, and, or, and Meredith and Gretchen. And then Colin and Christy and David and Lori from season nine were asked. Mm, okay. Huh. Yeah, no, out of that group, I would have, I mean, there's a few that names that you mentioned, uh, but the ones that just come to mind are obviously on my, were on my season because um, everybody were, uh, they were just standouts, you know. I mean, Lynn and Alex stood out on our season um, for different reasons. Meredith and Gretchen for different reasons. They were hilarious. But, um, but yeah, I don't, I just don't know how they made the selection. I was really happy to be asked to do it again. Um, cause it, it's really, it's, you know, it's, it's a, a lifetime, uh, of experiences that you get from doing that show and you really learn about yourself. So I, I just think it's hard though. It's really hard. It's not a cakewalk. People think that like I did, that it's going to be a cakewalk and it's not anything like it, a cakewalk. Yeah, so there wasn't really too much going to the first leg that really wasn't shown about you just because it was the whole Rob and Amber and like John Vito and Joe getting lost and stuff like that. So is there anything that you want to mention that happened in the first leg that was interesting or like what is, or maybe just talk about like what's that adrenaline feeling uh, like doing it again? Like does the rush come back or like maybe like how is it different? coming back for the second time because you obviously know what's going on and unlike yeah um you know what's going on but you do know that it's going to be a constant fight and because of that um you know you just really try to have all cylinders on blast and and be ready but um what i realized is that you know people would say how do you get ready for the amazing race and I remember we worked out, we tried to get strong and do all these things. And none of that had anything to do with most things because, you know, just getting lost a lot and um, not having any mental clarity or thoughts of your own about where you should go or any intuitive things that you can think of. I mean, those, those things, we, we think it's more luck and, you know, and uh, more luck than anything to do, to win and to be on that show because, I mean, there's not really any amount of pre preparation that you can do because you have no idea what you're going to do. I mean, you just have, I remember uh, on the All-Star, we, we were in, um, we were in, I want to say maybe Ushuaia or somewhere in South America and, um, and we had a challenge to just find this, this fishery place and we were using our, um, our compass, but I had no idea that we we're underneath the other half of the equator. And so the compasses were the opposite. So everywhere we were thinking we're going, we were going the opposite. And so we finally, I remember asking, we asked this cab driver, if he knew where this place was. And he said, yeah. And we said, can we follow you? So we following this guy, but um, he kind of kept honking at this guy going, hey, this guy's going completely wrong. He's going the wrong direction. And I go, just let him take us there because obviously we can't figure it out. We don't know where, we are, where we're going. And he got us there. But then one of the challenges was the directions through the town. And I wish we had have done it, but the key to that was figuring out that everything on your compass was going to be the opposite direction of what you thought. And yeah. so that was a real challenge. So some of those things like that, you could not plan for it. You know, there's no way that you can, you can go, let me study where the equator, you know, the compasses are going to be upside down or changing. You just, it's just hard to plan. You just got to be ready for anything and have your mind open that you really have no idea and no clue. I never understand when people are like, you're in a foreign place and you don't know where you're going. And obviously the compass thing was unique because it was the whole opposite direction. Who would have uh -huh. known that? But when a local's like, I know where I'm going, you're like, no, you, you don't. Challenge it. It's like, 
I live here. Like, why are you telling me where I, like, where, how I'm stuck with directions when I've been living here and you're right. arriving. So I just don't look that weird, but I guess it's like you're in a stressful situation. So. Yeah. Well, you know what the other thing is, is that, um, you, you forget about the language barriers. And so you're, you know, instead of thinking, oh, they, you know, they live here and they must know where they're going. You're thinking maybe they don't understand what I'm saying. <laughs> that That's a possibility, you know, that, okay, maybe he doesn't realize I'm trying to go here and not somewhere else. I don't know where they're taking us, you know, so you, you think that often, but um, that's, that's something that, you know, it's hard because you don't have, you don't, you don't speak the language. We had a lot of issues with language barriers or money um, exchange. And I remember going to, um, I don't remember where we were, but, oh, we were in uh, South America once again on the first show, on the first show. And we had to take a car and drive out to the polo ranches and, um, and everybody uh, just instantly jumps into the rental cars and start driving. But I, re I remember us having to get gas because they didn't put very much gas in these cars. And we were going to run out because we're just running as usual. We're riding all over the place. And we're riding through these fields and we're thinking, oh, my God, we got to get gas somewhere. And we finally see a gas station. And oh, my God, we're so happy. So we go into the gas station. We're like, I want twenty dollars, uh, you know, on this on this tank. And the guy literally looked at the money. He looked at the money as though we threw a bug at him, and, and he's like, "What do you want me to do with this?" And we're thinking we want gas, and he says, "I don't use this." He didn't take American dollars, and we didn't have his dollars. And he's like, "No gas." You need to you need to pay me with some soles or whatever, and I thought, oh my God, we have no gas. Almost we're almost on fumes, and we can't get gas because all we have is American dollars. So things like that, you know, people can never plan for unless you know where they're going. Yeah. So going into the All Stars, what was it like seeing Rob and Amber? Obviously, you guys seemed to bond in the beginning of season seven, but then you kind of seemed to maybe have a quote unquote rivalry. So, what was that relationship like? Maybe did you stay in contact with them beforehand, or were uh, what was it kind of like seeing them again and reigniting that old flame of a rivalry? <laughs> well, you know, it's um, I had always liked them, and so what I, what was, what was funny to me is that it's just watching things back and realizing how they felt cheated out the, you know, off the show, the first show, I didn't know that they felt that way. So it was really, it was definitely weird seeing them again. And I just thought, you know, I won't go into it. I'm going to still treat them the same, but um, knowing how they felt, about how they were cheated out of the whole thing. It was it was definitely awkward to see them, but I thought, oh, here we go again. I'm glad we have another chance, but um, but this time we know how they are and we know what to expect. So, but yeah, it was it was definitely awkward, especially after all the smack they talked when they were doing interviews. Yeah, do you still keep in contact with them? I haven't. Um, I know Yuchenna has spoken to them, you know, a little bit. Um, I was shocked to hear that they have four kids and, you know, and they're still together, which is beautiful. I'm glad they're still together. And, you know, they're just living, they're just, they're just reality show folks. I mean, that's their life and they're going to do that forever. And so I'm just happy that, you know, they seem to have a great life with their kids and everything. So, but no, I would, you know, I would love to be in touch with them. And I think about it often. I think about getting in touch with a lot of people often and I just don't, I haven't, but, um, but I don't hold any grudge against any, anybody. Who's yeah. It's, it's funny because uh, Rob had to convince Amber to do survivor and obviously come back for winners at war and she never wanted to do it, but Rob didn't want to do the race apparently and Amber had to convince him. That's why. Oh, wow. That's surprising. That was funny. But 
going That's into not his thing. He's a survivor guy. <laughs> yeah. Well, he was mad because they got cheated. So he was like, I don't want to deal with production. And so he like, said, yeah, because he said a lot of really mean things about production, us, and just the whole situation. And I, I just thought he was a sore loser. Um, so uh, going into the second leg, you obviously, mm -hmm. you got to go back to Santiago, which you went to in season seven. So did you feel like you kind of had like an advantage or were you just like, yeah, it doesn't really matter? Um, mm -hmm. I never felt like I had an advantage or an upper hand <laughs> because like I said, you have no idea what they're going to have you do. Um, I think Santiago is where we had to get in a, in a kayak again. It was, it was a, um, is that where we did that? I don't no, know. that was in, I think that was in Argentina and Santiago yeah. you had to go and scramble the letters and then you had to, I don't know what it's called. You had to like fix like these bolts on a tire and wield it with a wrench. So. Oh gosh. Yeah, that was real labor. That was, that was hard. That was tough stuff. But yeah, you know, like I said, how could you ever plan for that? I mean, really, that was difficult. This is hard work. I'm, I'm thinking, I'm not used to this. So yeah, it never gets easier. It's still just as stressful because you don't know what's coming at you. You don't know what you have to be prepared for. And you're always tired, thirsty, and hungry. So that doesn't help. Yeah, so how how annoying was trying to find the letters to get to the place where you had to find uh uh where you had to go to the little uh what do you call it where you had to like un where you had to uh fix the tire but you had to find letters um in that little office room and you're like oh, I'm paying attention to detail and then you unfortunately finish like second to last. So how annoying was that and then how stressful was maybe the drive after you finished doing the tires through that whole valley? Because you obviously drove through, uh, it wasn't really similar terrain, but you drove through the desert beforehand and you know how dangerous that could be. So how maybe dangerous was that in a sense because of the whole speed and li speeding limits and all that stuff. So maybe just take me through those two moments. Um, oh gosh, see, these are bad memories. The, um, that, <laughs> that office room, <laughs> finding the letters on it, something I had passed up a thousand times. I mean, you never feel more stupid when you, you watch something back like that and you go, oh my God, that was, that was, that was just too easy. You know what you're thinking? There's no way it's going to be that easy. But yeah, I mean, you feel really retarded and, and everybody gets to see it. And, and, you know, of course, in People, you think, oh, God, everybody's going to judge you, but yeah, it, it, you feel retarded. So, um, but yeah, I don't remember the drive, but I do remember that um, it, it wasn't as the, the second race and, and, and going to that area where those tires were, I mean, it just wasn't as glamorous as I, I wished it could have been, you know, and it was just, I mean, it's, it's always difficult finding where they want you to go to begin with. But when there's no real, um, there's no street signs and, you know, just things to, to figure out where you're supposed to be just adds extra tension and difficulty. And so it's always stressful. Every single thing we did on the show, every time was stressful. So that no less. Yeah. Well, what was it like being in your first foot race? Because in, uh, see, in that leg, you were kind of, I mean, you obviously weren't in last, but you were in a foot race between you, Joe and Bill, I think Eric and Danielle on that second leg, when you had to go to the pit stop or whatever, and they ended up like passing you. So maybe like, what's that moment? Like when you're, I don't even, I, I'm telling you the things that I don't like, and probably because I came in close to last, I, forgotten I don't even remember that but um, I'm not the fastest runner by far but uh, just when you think that you're kind of athletic <laughs> like I said you you will be humbled you will be humbled so anytime I couldn't come in bet in better place than second to last or almost you know or almost out of the race is really humbling so yeah I don't, I just I don't even remember the race. <laughs> so um, going into the third leg, how glad were you not to uh, shovel that fish into the like crate thing or whatever? And how funny was it? You got to see like the comparison between 
a good couple, Rob and Amber, supporting each other compared to a bad couple of Eric and Danielle and Eric just making fun of Danielle and her boobs and carrying the fish. So let me just talk about that because that was pretty funny. Is this when we were in in South America? Yeah, I think it was in Argentina. It was like the yeah, first time. and we had to we had to go to this the fishery. And we had to yeah. fish out and oh my gosh, yeah. See all those things. I just I I don't even remember those fishery, but I do remember um, a lot of um, uh, just I remember a lot of bickering between Eric and and Danielle. And I just thought, man, they are not going to last at all. They're going to remind me sort of of Ron and uh, Kelly a little bit. But um, yeah, that, that whole fish thing, I hated that whole thing. So a lot of those things that they have you do, I just, I'm just going, oh my God, couldn't have find a, found a better challenge. But um, I, I just don't remember. That's just this terrible. I don't remember the how I was feeling other than I hated those fish. Yeah, so uh, after that, like, we talked about the whitewater rafting beforehand, uh, so I don't need to mention that again. But after that, like, how annoying was to see Robin Amber pull a hat trick, win three legs in a row, and maybe, like, what were you thinking going into that fourth leg almost? Like, what was your mentality? Because you said in a confessional, like, Rob and Amber are obviously pissed off and they're using it as motivation and, but we beat them like when it counts. So like at that point where you like, Oh crap, like they're just going to kick our ass or like <laughs> what are you thinking, like in that fourth, like maybe in the mentality of it, like the beginning of it. Well, you know, like I said, it was awkward at the beginning and from the beginning, all I had hoped is that they don't continue to win, but they kept having really good luck. And I thought, oh my gosh, they have to, I just, I just really wished that something would go wrong for a change and right for us for a change. And so I was definitely happy. Is that when they got, they were almost booted out? No, um, that's, when, that's when they got eliminated. But I was just wondering, like, what was your beginning mentality? And I definitely am going to keep addressing this, like, uh, so going into, um, I wanted them out <laughs> wherever you want. I, I forget where you went to be honest with you. I just remember like the parts of happening, like during the episode, but you go to this roadblock and you have to, uh, basically decipher. I think you chose the one where you had to decipher a map, if I'm not mistaken, and you had to mm-hmm. like spell things correctly, which dear Lord, if that was the challenge, I would suck at that because I'm terrible <laughs> at spelling. Thank God for automatic spell check. But Mm -hmm. how satisfying was it beating them in that roadblock, just seeing them so frustrated and you beat them and then you get on some flight or whatever the next day to some country. So how satisfying was that? Uh, The first part. And then the second part is what are you thinking when, because people don't realize is that you're basically in the same position that Rob and Amber are in and Charlotte and Myrna are in because mm. of the both times or whatever. So yeah. what's that like maybe someone being there, like you're stressed out, you're at the bottom, you're next to a team that's your rivals. You not saying that you can't stand them, but you want them gone. So <laughs> what are you thinking when like you're on that little boat ride and then you have to get those letters or whatever? Mm. Um, like even before that, like what are you thinking at that moment? Wait. Well, you know, anytime you could not, you could at least beat one team. We'd always say, if we could beat at least one team, then you're still in it. You still got a chance. So more than anything, you, it's, just, it's just really scary when you are the only team left doing a challenge. That's when you really start to stress a lot more. So as long as you can see them, I'm thinking, you know, in a foot race, I think we could beat them. Um, Yuchenna used to be run track, although I'm the slow one in the team, but he can run track and at the very least he can drag me along. And I know I can kind of, you know, have a little bit of his draft and, and be able to run. But, but as long as we can beat him, I'm, I'm excited. But yeah, that whole challenge um, once again, you know, you're on TV and you feel really retarded that you don't know how to spell these things. I remember we had a map challenge and 
the, that map thing was really challenging because um, if you lay a, a, a globe out flat, all the countries that would be in the middle are now on the end. And, and that was something that just, I couldn't grasp at first because you're thinking, wait, this place, this country that's now over here on the end, if you, if you folded it up into a, a globe, it would be over here. Yeah. But we kept thinking, why isn't this working? This country used to be over here. But finally it hit, it hit me. And I was just so glad it hit me before it did hit Rob and Amber. Because like I said, as long as you can beat at least one team, then you know you got a shot to still run again. So um, I was thrilled that we were able to finally figure out how to smell, figure out where the countries are and just get out of there ahead of them. Because all I kept thinking, like I said, is I just know that they want revenge and this is going to be their opportunity. So I hope that they, I hope that they can uh, not uh, do well in this challenge. That's what I, I really wanted them out though. Yeah. Just well, because. I feel like every well. Well, it's funny that not uh, too many winners were asked back. And it's funny because I talked to Joe, Bill, Joe and Bill about it. And they said that the they eventually used this title, I think, in season 18. If I'm not mistaken, that was the actual number of it. They said mm -hmm. it was unfinished business. So I was like, what unfinished business do winners have? Like, you already won. Like, why are they calling this season, like, unfinished business? Like, ah. so that, was just, that was just kind of weird. Not that, yeah. not that well, I was talking about called, but I was like, why are they going to call this? Unfinished business. Maybe because they think that, you know, in order to really, I mean, if you do all-stars, you want to be, you want to be the winner of winners. I don't know. I yeah, mean, you can look at it that way. Yeah. But yeah, the, the business is, it's never done. If you want to, if you want to keep winning a million and live your life as a reality star, like Robin Amber you got to keep winning. So it's always unfinished. Yeah. So what was it like when you get on the boat and you're with Rob and Amber, and then you have basically another needle in the haystack challenge, which honestly I couldn't stand at that point because it's just dumb luck. And who knows, you could be there for four hours or like four minutes. And uh, when I talked to Joe and Bill, they were with the beauty Queens and they actually saw Rob pass over his letter when he was with Myrna so yeah. did you notice that, and maybe just from a viewer's perspective, because this is one of like the biggest upsets ever. It's like a 16 seed beating a one seed in the NCAA tournament. What <laughs> are you thinking when Charlotte and Mirna get that clue? And they're like, obviously you don't see them in the woods panicking because you know they're going to lose in a foot race. No right. But what is that like just as somebody who was there in this moment is still talked about like 13 years later or however long it's been? Yeah. Um, Oh gosh, I re I remember someone said, um, I think my husband said um, Rob passed up his name, but Rob doesn't have that kind of patience. I'm surprised that he did it and not Amber because Amber seems like somebody who's like a stickler for details and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. But apparently she did the first two. So but if you think about it, you know, you pick it, not knowing what you're going to do. You have no idea what you're going to do and it'll give you a slight clue. And then based on that clue, you know, you, between the two of you decide who's going to do it. So that was the wrong challenge for him to have picked because he's clearly does not have the patience for that kind of thing. And, or an eye for those details, those tiny details too. And that was definitely stressful just standing there trying to find a letter in the haystack like you said it definitely was a needle in the haystack but I was so happy to find one uh, once again to be ahead of them because I thought this is we have to be the last few teams left and one of us is not going to be here tomorrow so uh, it was it was dumb luck for me to find a letter but um it was terrible for Rob because he could have clearly been out of there long before. Yeah. Either of us. But well, and we've, I, uh, you first. Oh, sorry. Well, we've seen on amazing race, like you have a clue for a roadblock or whatever. And you're like, it's not you, but it just like in general, somebody would be like, I would be perfect for that. or I'd be great for that. And then they read the clue and it's like, 
oh my god this is my worst fear why on earth am i doing this completely physical like it's like who wants to do this and it's like uh-huh. you think it's yeah gonna be like something because like they don't tell you don't know what it is and they sometimes they might give you a hint and say something about heights or tall or <clears throat> or water but for the most part they don't tell you and so you know, um, and if you're strategizing, you might be thinking, well, I want to save the strength or the might for something that's stronger. But then, you know, like one of my um, challenges, I mean, on the first race, when um, Yuchenna did the shopping in the village, I was, he's like, you should have totally done that one. And I was thinking, I wanted him to do it, <laughs> you know, and I wish I had done that one, but you don't know going into it. And so, yeah, sometimes you're just going, damn, that was a waste of strength or a waste yeah. of, you know, whatever. That was a wimpy one. You should have done that one or whatever. But yeah, you have no idea. So that was, that was dumb luck for me to, to find my letter in for Rob to have selected that one. Yeah. That was not his to win. Well, when you got to the place, like, did you see like the post office or could you not really like see anything? Like when um when we went to get to pick the letters yeah so when you got off the boat and before you, like you get the roadblock clue and before you pick like did you see it because a lot of people like sometimes like you can see it like uh my friend corinne who was on season 31 so not this season but the season before uh she like they prepared and they were like okay if it's driving like you do this and if it's height you do this and if it's this you do this so like did you were you able to like see it I don't, you know, because, you know, it, it, I think it said something about the last um, post office uh, in, at the world. And so it's one of those, you know, just things that where you're, yeah. you're going, what could that be? But I thought, you know, I, I thought I was better at um, details than Yuchenna. He's definitely stronger and faster and um and doing other things you know so we we had we had our strengths but yeah we tried to figure that out most of the times but sometimes it just does the clue doesn't lend itself to helping you out yeah so not that it really mattered but how nice was it to get an actual nice letter from someone and not like somebody completely thrashing you like the beauty queens and rob and amber and uh who was the other one that, oh, Marshall and Lance sent Charlotte and Mira. Who did the beauty queens get a bad letter? <laughs> they got a bad letter from Team Bama. Only one of them signed it. And they were like, <sighs> we had great memories with you, but we don't really respect you as people. And like Susan and Patrick said that they were like, we hope Rob and Amber are starving and near elimination. <laughs> I think like Marshall and Lynch called like Charlotte and Mirna bitches or something. Like I was like, <laughs> they were like really mean to some teams. So I know. Was, but it must have been nice. To, I'm surprised your letter was from Susan and Patrick and not Meredith and Gretchen or someone. But I, I adored Susan and Patrick too. I, I kept in touch with them for a while too because they were sweet people. I, I adored them. But um, no, that was nice. I had no idea that you could have had a, a mean letter. I don't think I noticed that until I watched this show. <laughs> that was terrible. Yeah. Was so rude. So, yeah. uh, after, so how satisfying was it? We saw like in the next episode, you guys were just like eating dinner at the resort and then Charlotte and Mirna walk in. You obviously saw them at the pit stop. But how nice was it just to see the front runners go home? And then going to that fifth leg, what was your mindset? Because you obviously had a non-elimination leg at that point. So, like, were you like, okay, this is a fresh start. Now we're the biggest starts here. We can definitely, like. Yeah, we, we were thinking that. I think we probably got ahead of ourselves because we were thinking that, um, you know, definitely nice that those guys were out. Everybody was thrilled. Um, because the way that, you know, they play in general, they, they just, you know, it's good for TV, but when you're the, on the end, the other end of it, half the time you're thinking, wow, they are so mean about how they play. But um, so, yeah, it was definitely nice that they were gone and we were thinking that, um, you know, maybe we can take some chances um, and we can, you know, start swinging a little harder to just jump a little further ahead and, um but yeah, it was, it, that was definitely a nice break and mentally and 
um, and just happy to see them gone just because the, the energy that they bring, they're just so, they stress everyone out. But, um, but no, it was good. It was really people good. Out. She doesn't seem like the girl to stress people out. She seems like she puts people in check. Who does? I'm surprised that Amber stresses people out because like. Well, she's sweet. Oh, because if I was like a survivor, I would be like, she would be like the person, like, I'd be like, she can't hurt a fly. Like, she's like yeah. really nice. No, she's sweet, but she's very conniving. So she, she has a very deep mind. So I, you know, I respect the way she thinks, but she's very sweet in general, in general. So she, she could talk Rob into doing some things. You yeah. Know, because, because Rob, will, Rob doesn't mind being the bad guy. Yeah, I personally don't. I personally think, like, this is just off topic, but I think it's bull crap when everybody's like, she's an undeserving winner of Survivor and all that other stuff. And I'm like, I don't get it. She worked, you know, she worked it to, to make her win, and that's all I can. Like, yeah. Yeah, uh, she won. So, hey, you know what? Um, I mean, you know, you don't have to always fight, and you don't always have to do undermine uh, undermining of people and just to win, you know, or putting people down or maybe not outwardly, maybe internally she could have been thinking things like that, but she, she, you know, she comes off as, as very kind for the most part, but she's always thinking. So. Yeah. So going into uh, Mozambique, why was it so difficult to maybe now, uh, navigate and uh, you talked a lot about uh, obviously you've talked a lot about about how you don't really like doing physical things it's not really your cup of tea so why on earth would you pick shoveling all that coal into that uh, what do you call it that little basket when it like I think I was watching it and people were like I've cut my hands rather than just painting a couple of nails you know what we started thinking Really, literally, we started thinking, you know, when they're, they sound simple, we're thinking, oh, there's going to be some twists, some devilish twists that you can't even imagine. And it can't ever be as simple as that. Yeah. And that's what we were thinking. And, and a lot of times we would say, well, if it's physical, it's something we know we can, we can, you know, brute through with, with the China, yeah, but cool. we're thinking, He's not going to be able to paint nails and, and, and we should have totally gone for that. Cause that was so much easier, but you know, in hindsight, <laughs> I wish we would have. Yeah. Well, I talked to uh, Joe and Bill about it and they were like, well, who would have thought like in a Muslim country in Africa that a male's job was to paint fingernails? Like who would have even like guessed that? So mm -hmm. like, so what is that like when you're like struggling to find these houses and you had obviously been through like a non-elimination before in the last series, but it was like the final three. So, I mean, you pretty much knew like when there wasn't people, like you wouldn't be eliminated because who would have a final leg with two teams that had never happened before? When, when on the first show? On the first show, like when you finish, like when you finished in last, like, you kind of knew since there weren't people that it was going to be a non-elimination just because they've never really had a final two with two teams and right. understand why they would do that anyways. Right. So what is that like when you're like lost and you can't find these houses? You don't know if you're last, because I think you said like when he was like, you're the last team to arrive, you were like, really? So maybe just talk about like, where did you think you were like placement wise? And then how shocked were you uh when you got to the mat and you were last and in the back of your mind you're probably thinking like holy crap this is elimination length because it's only the fifth leg yeah oh on the <clears throat> this you're going back to the first one or this, no on the, the mozambique one i was just giving the first one as an example because you finished in last before and it was an on elimination but you kind of right. know what it was so maybe just talk about how difficult it was to find those houses and then, um, like, where did you think you were placement wise? Because you seemed kind of shocked that you were in last. Oh, went on the on the All Stars. On the Mozambique one, when you finished in last place in that one, and you got you couldn't find the houses, and you got to the mat, and he was like, "You're the last one to a lot to arrive," and you were like, "Really?" So, like, where did you think you like were exactly, or like? 
And we weren't eliminated then, right? Yeah, you weren't eliminated, but you seemed like you were really shocked that you were in last. I think um, what I uh, what I don't I don't quite remember it totally, but what I what I do think sometimes it goes way faster than than you think, and and it seems like it must have been an easier challenge for others because half the time it takes so long to do most of these challenges and you're thinking other people have to be having the same struggles as as we are and so if 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 you come in like when when i guess when we did i probably didn't imagine that um we were the only ones having as much trouble as we did so you know that's it was shocking but um Half the time, you know, it takes way longer than than you would imagine to do a, a simple thing, just because of the language barriers, not being able to read, the you know, and just for very all sorts of different reasons. And so, yeah, maybe I was shocked because I thought everybody else should have had as much trouble as I did. Yeah. So going into oh, that, I, was that the uh, newspapers? Uh. You had to deliver newspapers in the town. I was trying to remember what that was. I can. I know you had to do the coal thing, and uh -huh. you had to do. Um, let me just check really quick because I I remember the coal thing really well because of the whole Oswald and Danny and uh, trying to chase Phil around at the pit stop, which was really funny. And I actually had Danny on my podcast. Um, <laughs> I like Danny and Oswald. How are they? Uh, I talked to Danny, but unfortunately, I haven't talked to Oswald, but unfortunately, I used it on a my iPad and never recorded. So, oh no! I spent two hours talking to him, and it was a great podcast. So I'm oh. talking about it again. Oh no! Does he know that? Oh yeah, I was like, uh, I sent it. I was. He was like, "When is this posted?" And I'm like. I sorry like the second I like like I thought it was recording because I put it like saved low computer and I was like are you kidding me no way oh, oh my yeah. god it happens <laughs> so you either had to um for the detour you either had to uh oops that, yeah for the roadblock you ha oh that's what I forgot it was the rat one I forgot about the rat question. So how cool was it when you had to guide that rat and you get to find the mine? Because that looked cool as like all heck because you had to like, it was like- The biggest like rat ball. ever, weren't they? Yeah, so how cool is that? You know what, it was, um, it was an interesting history lesson too. The fact that the island still had to hunt for un- um, explosive, uh, unexploded uh, explosives. You know, the fact that they still had to do that, I thought, that is really crazy. That means it hadn't been that many years ago when they had unrest there. So that was a little scary um, to know that that was a real thing that they did. But um, it was definitely scary seeing those big old rats coming out. They were huge. And, you know, uh, I was surprised that to learn how smart rats were. But um, I really didn't want to get anywhere near any of those rats. But uh, <laughs> like I said, it, even though those things look really cool, they're always hard because it, they're not going to make it that easy for you most of the time. But uh, it was a cool experience because it's not one, like I said, how could you ever plan for that? You know, let me, let me work on my rat skills, you know, at home <laughs> and get ready for that. You know, it's just one of those things, very unique. But that, that place we were in, in Mozambique, was absolutely beautiful, though. I loved being there. Yeah. But it was sad at the same token, because it's a very poor country. Yeah, so going, uh, what was my question about Mozambique? So um, you guys obviously faced elimination before, and you had to give up all your money and all your possessions. But this time, you had a 30-minute uh, march for elimination which one do you prefer more or do you wish it was like the modern version now where they just have a speed bump? Like which penalty would you have preferred? Like, were you glad to have the 30 minute penalty rather than like losing all your money and stuff or? 
oh my God, the losing all your money. And I mean, it wasn't even just your money. It was your clothes, your money, everything. That was just cruel. I thought that was cruel. And I thought, oh my God, that is so wrong. I'm glad they don't do that anymore because I mean, there's so many, so many things wrong with that. I mean, uh, just not having deodorant, toothbrush, toothpaste. soap, or uh, change of clothes. And I mean, we smelt like onions for, you know, forever. And we, and we were dirty as uh, forever. And just, it was just so humiliating. So I would take the, the speed bump any day. Yeah, 30 because they seem to recover. You know, the last episode the uh, of Amazing Race, I remember those girls, they didn't they have like two speed bumps each time. They they won them and they won it over and still placed and stayed in the game. And I'm oh, like, Oh yeah, the blondes from this season. Yeah. yeah I, would, I, actually, I actually interviewed them too for my podcast because they're from Charleston as well. So that was pretty cool interviewing people from my home. Wow. Family. Yeah. I mean that yeah. I mean they were lucky. They just did well and and I thought, man, I wish we had that instead. I would take that any day over them taking all of our stuff because that was just really hard. Because if we would have been stuck there, I don't know what they would have done. If we couldn't have raised any money or got anybody to, to put us in their cab or, you know, just I would have I would have taken that any day. Yeah, and I feel like the emotional stress that comes along with that, like, is just too much to bear when you're already panicked and you're yeah. already like just like more you can't even think straight like as it i mean you're already like i said you're hungry you're tired the other thing to 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 remember is that when you're traveling to all these different countries there's different time zones you know and Jet and lag. You might think, oh, okay, now that I'm going to this other place, I'll be able to, you know, I got I got the timing down a little better. I'll be able to relax. But then you remember, oh no, wait, they're behind. And so now I are they're ahead. So now I gotta get up earlier. I have even less time in between. And and really, I don't know if anyone said, but when you have the breaks in between the 12 hours in between you're not really resting they're interviewing you most of the time and you you interview in the order that you come in and you can't do anything until after your interview's done yeah that's what i've heard one of my friends who was on it the uh, korean she had to do like a roadblock where you had to climb up this like slippery like uh wet it was almost like uh what do you call it like a like it was like made out of bounce house material or whatever but it was like a giant like hill wow and you had to, it, you were, it was like completely raining and she was completely wet and they got to the pit stop like in ninth out of 11th like position oh. and she was like i'm freezing i'm wearing like a small tank top and mm -hmm. like she was like threatening them that she wanted to put on her beanie because she was so cold so i can't even yeah. imagine like and they make you sit there how awful that must be mm -hmm. they make you sit there because they want you to still be in the mindset they want you to still look like you just came off like it just happened and so they don't want you to go change they don't want you to do anything to look different and and, and it's unfortunate so if you're close to the end of the end of the uh the line and coming in almost last you have that many hours before you get to your interview time yeah and I don't understand why well I understand why they do it but I'm ho I hope they get better at it now because I remember watching the Robin Amber and the Charlotte and Myrna episode and obviously I knew the order and everything because I've seen these seasons plenty of times yeah but you see Robin Amber being interviewed outside like near the pit stop where you can kind of tell that they got eliminated and then Sharla and Myrna and I think yourselves were interviewed in the hotel room and I'm like mm. well clearly that shows they've made it because why <laughs> are they interviewed in the hotel room and they're yeah. still running and why is this other team being interviewed outside yeah yeah well normally they don't even let you go inside unless that's where the pit stop is but actually usually it's like outside somewhere yeah so I, I hope they fix that. 
but I'm almost mm-hmm. done. So going into the sixth leg, <laughs> thank you for being so patient, by the way. Maybe uh, no this. worries. But uh, so going into the sixth leg, what's your mentality? You just got off a uh, non-elimination leg. You have that mark for elimination. And obviously you saw, I'm not sure if you watched the season prior, but that kind of uh, beat Team Kentucky in the butt when they were on season 10. Mm. The 30 minutes kind of screwed them. And 30 minutes can screw a lot of teams. So I mean, yes. mindset going into that leg um just coming mm-hmm. off of a really bad finish after you did pretty decently in the other couple like yeah no um i mean shoot anything that adds time to you know when you're already <laughs> you you know usually people you can if you look at the timing sometimes people are just a couple minutes couple seconds off of you and then you you get added you know 30 minutes or however long extra that's just frightening. That's just something that, you know, I mean, you just feel like I might as well just lay down and cause this just is over. But, um, you know, um, when, uh, when you said that it made me think about, um, uh, when you have to show up for, um, taking off when you're at the pit stop or have to come to the pit stop, no one tells you it's your turn to go to the pit stop. You have, they leave it up to you to arrive at the pit, at the start of it, of a pit, um, to yourself, they, they leave it up to you to arrive there on time. So what they don't always show is that if someone oversleeps or, you know, like in my case, we were in Africa in one episode, I think this was on the all-star, um, my little tiny alarm clock stopped working. Um, because the batteries fell out the back and I didn't, or, or they were, or they weren't working anymore. They just stopped working. And so I kept looking at my watch I, I, or clock. I'd get up and look at it. And I kept thinking, oh, I still have time. Meanwhile, we slept past our departure time. So I'm shocked that they didn't show that. <laughs> sometimes they'll show the door. And then they'll show the time and then they show everybody leaving. But that happened to us. Uh, and I just remember waking up and I said, oh, my God, I think, you know, we've missed our our um, our pit stop, our departure time. And they don't they don't bother to wake anyone up. So, you know, you're always stressed because you think you're going to sleep too long if you if you finally get to sleep. Or, you know, you just, it, there's so many things that can go wrong. And so adding extra time anywhere, like we added that time at the beginning of our leg, which lost our lead at that time. And, you know, we started after other people had already left who came in after us. Yeah. That sucks. Yeah, I'm shocked they didn't show that just because they should. I think they've only shown that in one season when the gutsy grannies from season two overslept mm-hmm. and it was like left 45 minutes after departure time. So yeah. I'm shocked they don't show that because like obviously nowadays they have a lot more equalizers with, uh, I mean, obviously, which I'll get to in a little bit, mm-hmm. uh, the flights can be the death of you. <laughs> Yeah, they can, and they do. They are. But uh, now they have a lot more equalizers, so I bet they probably don't show that now, but just shocked that they didn't show that. But uh, how glad were you to get that flight to uh, Dar Salaam? Because when I talked to Joe and Bill, they were like, with all the connections that we had to take, we maxed out one of the sound guy's credit cards, and we had over $50,000 worth of airline tickets like in our possessions. So – Maybe just talk about like avoiding the nightmare from hell and how that kind of helped you through uh, just the whole, like, just, I mean, it's booking the flight, so it's not really entertaining, but like it had a huge impact on the leg, obviously. And uh, I, yeah, um, well, I think the biggest thing with Dar es Salaam is that um, no one anticipated that these travel agencies would not take credit cards they did not they they said that they said oh we don't take credit cards did the race production do that because i'm like well then they're like what are we supposed to do they did not know that and 
so we're thinking, oh, we started out early. We've already scoped out an agency we can go get our tickets from. And they tell us, you know, because I think we had to fly to Poland and we were like, you know, how, how can we get there? Can you, and they're like, okay, yes, we can do this. So they mapped it out and, you know, and they said, um, this is what's gonna, this is how much it'll cost. So we, I put the credit card down and she's like, oh, we don't take credit cards. And I think because they probably had a lot of problems with fraud. Yeah. And so we were like, well, what are we supposed to do? They said, we only, you got to pay cash. So that became a production problem where I don't think they've ever experienced that or had an issue like that. And they had to call to the corporate office in New York to get approval because the production people had to, or our, um, our uh, camera crew had to use their credit card to get cash off of it. And, um, and, they, and they had to authorize everyone to be able to use that credit card as an ATM uh, you know, withdrawal. And so there was, a, there was a delay in the production just for them to get the authorization. But then one thing that was really interesting, and I don't think they could have, I don't know how they could have put this together, but we go to, um, uh, we find one of only maybe four or five ATM machines. And we go to the, uh, to the bank and outside the bank are two armed guards with um, bulletproof vests. Oh my God. They have like machine guns, I think. And they're standing out there and, and monitoring the line of people waiting to go to the ATM. And I thought, well, this isn't a good site, you know, a good sign that we had to stand in line. But what was really funny is that we stood in line behind like a, um, a Marsa warrior. He was at the teller machine <laughs> waiting to go. And I just thought, this is so modern, you know, the Marseille warriors, you know, they don't just live out in the go in the fields with the goats. They're actually they use the banks. So um, they were standing in line, and we finally get to the to go inside. And inside of this um, bank door, it, they just had the teller machines. So they only let so many people in at a time. So we go in, and we're thinking, okay, we have to get this amount of money. And the machines they only allowed like 500 whatever's each time. So we had to do this a few times. So we left that ATM machine with a big pile of money. Well, I'm thinking if the, if the two guys standing out there with the machine guns with um, bulletproof vests, what are they guarding? Like who is yeah. taking this? So I'm imagining I got this big stack of cash I could probably die. Yeah, who are these random people walking out of a bank with cameras around with a big, big, uh, what do you call it, stack of money? I'm going, I, okay, we probably shouldn't have this out in the open because I'm trying to imagine the people that they're guarding right here, how much are they getting out? They're not getting out stacks of money like we are. So we probably would be dead people walking. So we're like stashing it all over our bodies, putting it inside of our pants. And then we walk out and cause the guy kept the, the guard kept looking in and saying, are you guys okay? Are you okay? We're like, we're, we're good. We just have a little trouble, but we're good. Cause we kept sticking it back in to get more money. Well, we decided to go, I think we just, uh, we got the money that we thought we needed. We went back to the agency, we gave it to her. And of course, these ATM machines in Dar es Salaam are issuing money that's from their currency in Dar es Salaam. So we give her the money and she goes, oh no, she says, I thought you were gonna give us American dollars. So this stack of cash is only whatever percentage of Dar es Salaam money to American cash that we needed. So we had to go back, find the other bank and get this much cash, <laughs> this much cash. We had to get a ton more. And so we're, we're like going from bank to bank trying to find it because all the other contestants are doing the same thing and they're overdrawing oh, these banks. So they were running out of money and we're literally running around town with stacks of cash so it that was a real crazy challenge to begin with, but 
I'm so glad we finally were able to get out of there because I really thought we would die if anybody caused, I, I think our heads would be cut off for that kind of cash. Yeah, well, the currency is like really whack. Apparently it's like one US dollar is like 2,319 like shillings yeah. or something like that. I know. Can you imagine how many I don't know. stacks of it we needed? <laughs> yeah, I don't know like what that's translated because I know like for like when uh, obviously I mentioned before, which will probably be cut, uh, when I applied for like the survivor job, I'm like, oh my God, I'm going to be rich because the currency in Fiji, it's like one third for like a dollar in America is like three dollars in Fiji. So I'm going to yeah. be like, rich or whatever. So like, yeah. <laughs> I can't imagine like uh, figuring out the currency thing. And we saw that like you guys were in there for like four hours and it's like, what I'm like, are these people like that dumb? Like it's their job, and like, why are they in here? For, why are the why are the contestants in here for like five hours? And why is this so slow? Yes, it's so crazy. That explains a lot. Yeah, it was crazy, and it, it's just something that I don't think anybody had imagined. Like, who doesn't take credit cards? But you know, in some of these small areas, these outlying countries, you know, they just don't use those machines because it costs money. They didn't. Yeah, so you get the tickets and then you get to go to Dar es Salaam and you're obviously in a good position because you're ahead of Eric and Dan Danielle. Um, you're ahead of Eric, Danielle, Terry and Ian and Joe and Bill. Um, so then going into um, the detour, um, you got, it was either solid or scalp where you had to like trek a bunch of wood to a place and get in a shipyard or whatever, or you do a puzzle. How, um, I mean, a puzzle's not too interesting, but how interesting was it like doing a puzzle or whatever? Because they hadn't really done that on Amazing Race. Like they don't really do like too many puzzles. So were you like excited because you talk about like the physical aspect wasn't your cup of tea, but if I had to guess, you were probably like really smart mentally and you uh, seemed like watching all the episodes like you were good at thinking quick on your feet so how cool mm -hmm. how nice was it maybe to do a mental challenge for once um I always thought the mental challenges would be better but clearly not <laughs> like I said it, you know they don't they don't really make anything easy for you so um yeah I thought it would definitely be easy but it wasn't nothing on there on that show is easy they just don't make it easy for you. I think they want, want you to get to a point where um, humans are going, oh my God, if I had to do this, what would I do? You know, it's a challenge. And, and then you just become mentally and physically tired of doing everything. But, um, but yeah, I did. I, I think going into it, I thought it would be a breeze, but never. Oh, oh I forgot. Uh, so how how cool or how fun was the boat ride to Zanzibar or did you get seasick like uh, uh, Sharla? Oh, um, see boats again. Okay, so <laughs> there's a theme with yeah. me. But um, I thought it was absolutely beautiful, um, the ride. Um, the only problem was, well, two. It was so ridiculously hot. And so there's no place to find shade because they don't have an undercarriage or whatever on this boat. So you're just out there with the sun. So we're just completely just burning up. But two, I had to go to the restroom. And so once again, they don't have facilities like that on those, those kind of boats. So, um, so I was a little uncomfortable. It was a long boat ride, the longest yeah. ride. Huh? It seemed very long. I think it was like 10 hours or something like that. Wow, I didn't know it was that long because it, it seemed like it took up like 15 hours the episode. Like, why are these people on this, not 15 hours, like 15 minutes out of the hour episode. It's like, why are these people on a boat so long and why do they keep talking on the boat? Like, so yeah, I didn't know. It, it was, was like ridiculously long and, and, and it just seemed like there was just no, you know, no land in sight, but one of our um, production people had to go to the restroom too. And he said, he says, why don't you just, you know, hang off the side of the boat and in the water. And I thought there's probably shark in the water. <laughs> I was scared to death. I just thought, 
I will just wait until we get to land because I'm just oh dying. Oh my god, I, I would die. Like, yeah, I, someone hung off the side of the boat, yeah. literally, in the water, and drug himself in the water. I so, thought, oh. so because you had that boat ride for so long, uh, why did you try to decide to do the tossing uh, when you'd like to- uh you to do that thing where you had to like toss the boomerang or club and you had to hit a target or whatever when you crushed the spear throwing in the previous season. Because if I were you, I would be like, that's my cup of tea. Like, <laughs> I really don't, didn't remember having strength from that one. I just thought it was a fluke that I finally got some, oh. some, uh, some might to finally throw this because I was so determined. But I don't think I, I thought I was like, okay, now I got this kind of thing. But yeah. yeah. I, 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 any, like I said, anything physical, I, I wanted him to always do because I just definitely still didn't believe that I had the ability to get it done quickly. Most of the time I wanted it just, you know, just, just to go away. If it was me doing it, usually we're going to be there for hours. Yeah. So after that, uh, obviously going to Poland was probably one of the worst travel bookings you probably booked in your entire life. (laughs) <laughs> but uh how emotional was it um going to Auschwitz? Um you know um we were trying to guess we we're always trying to guess where we're going and um we were on a bus we were on a bus heading into Auschwitz and you're seeing we're seeing signs but what was really creepy is as we're going up the street it seemed like fog or smog or something. Clouds were rolling up from the ground. And it was starting to become like more of an eerie kind of drive into this area. And so when we, when we, when we finally stopped and we realized where we were, they gave us the clue or we got the clue and they told us, you know, this is a sacred place and, you know, no running, no screaming, no, you know, all these things. And we thought, oh, well, shoot, we're in a race. What kind of place is this? And then, of course, we get out and we're like, oh, my God, we're at the camps, at the actual campground. And it was just, it was a little bit of an emotional thing because, you know, it's so eerie to see it in pictures and to actually be there. So I thought, what kind of reality stuff could we possibly do that would really um respect the people that you know that died there and i thought gee so it was nice what they did they said you know just walk to the railroad tracks and um i think we had to go the route that most people went when it was their last journey you know they had to get on the railroad tracks and that was to the incinerators which you know so that was very eerie and then we had to light a candle and read this poem so I thought that was very respectful. Um, and it was an amazing experience. One of those things you can just check off your, your, you know, your list of things you want to do in life. But I don't think, I don't know if I ever wanted to go to Auschwitz, but definitely something that, you know, I'm thankful that I had that experience because it was just, it was just creepy. And it was weird to see that it really is a place. It really did happen. It really exists, you know, because some yeah. people, I mean, my grandpa helped liberate concentration camps um, wow. during that time period. So I can only imagine, like, it's probably like, I, when I talked to Joe and Bill about it, it was almost like they could feel like people, like you could almost like feel a presence there. So yeah. it but, felt really eerie. And I just felt like if I listened, I felt like I might hear cries or something, you know, or screams, but because it just felt like there had to have been spirits there and it was just really eerie but um but i'm glad we did something respectful respectable you know and um we didn't run through and dig up stuff and you know so i i just it was just a nice experience i felt like they threw that in just to go there yeah so i forgot i forgot to ask in the previous like there was an unaired roadblock and i think it was something to do with a boat again you kept having going boats so what was that unaired roadblock if you don't mind asking and was it fun or boring or were you just like because i saw i think i saw one of you with a life jacket on 
or something like that? You were in oh my gosh. I don't remember what it was. I'm going to have to look it up. You have to remind me. It just um, uh, I think Joe and Bill said something about a boat, but I wasn't I wasn't really sure. It just says like on the Amazing Grace Wiki or whatever, like this roadblock is unaired and yada 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 yada. Ooh, I vaguely remember something like that, but I don't recall what it was. I'll have to I'll have to remember myself. Um, yeah, I don't I don't remember it to tell you the truth. But yeah, sometimes they they just say it doesn't fit in the show. You know, um, but you got me uh, wondering now. Yeah, but I only have three more questions. So. <laughs> okay. So um, after the Auschwitz leg, you finish uh, near the top. And it's funny because you guys actually finished a leg before some teams. Uh, you guys are departing for the next leg before some teams are actually finishing a leg. Mm -hmm. So... You go for the fast forward with Oswald and Danny. Um, I mean, now in retrospect, you're probably like, I can climb through an, an abundance of stairs now. And that's like easy peasy cardio workout. Like, were you glad <laughs> that because you didn't have to do it? Never with easy cooler. So were you glad that you did that not only to get the lead, but you didn't have to deal with the whole sausage thing and Miss California, like having the time of her life and oh my god, yeah, night. So I mean, that was, that whole that whole little um, that whole thing uh, was so it was fun, but those stairs were you know as you can imagine going up and down a ton of stairs. That's hard. I mean, it's just tiring, but, but it was fun because we, we got to see the, the town there and it was so cool. It felt like a throwback, but um, no, I love that. I forgot about that. But that was really cool. Yeah. The pit stop scared the crap out of me because it looked like something out of like sleepy hollow with like the fog in the background. I was like, why is like, I understand like they went to Auschwitz, but I'm like, why is this leg like so uh, gloomy and like really I know. Like, dear God, it's like you think an axe murderer is going to come out and chop someone's head <laughs> off. Like, it was yeah, like, that whole like, town was foggy and, and eerie and strange. You know, it definitely felt like a throwback or for a, a Harry Potter movie or something. Yeah, a haunted house <laughs> that, or something. Yeah, like that. <laughs> that was but, strange. Uh, uh, one of my last questions is, so what was the rationale between picking the our uh flight advantage to malaysia because i mean you guys know like you've won this race like there's there's equalizers and yeah. you might want to go for a risk in the final leg because you never know what can happen but what was that rationale and then how disappointing was it not only not getting on the flight but when you get there and obviously i've interviewed a couple other teams that this has happened to where you get a clue and it just says head directly to the pit stop yeah. Um, hmm. Well, I think we thought that we were in a good position and safe enough to take a leap of faith. And um, we thought, you know, one thing they always said or people would say on the show is you definitely want a direct flight. You know, you don't want any flight where you have to change ever because you can never rely on the other flight being on time or whatever happens or are you getting there on time? So, um, so, you know, we decided to take a risk and it was totally unnecessary, but we just went for it. And um, really it would have worked out. One thing they didn't show, which would have, um, I don't I, I it would have been really nice to sh for them to show it. But when we got to, I think we had to go to Germany for a flight, um, to, uh, for our first part of the flight. And then we had a change, or no, we had a change in Germany. That's what it was. We flew to Germany and that's where we were gonna do our flight change. And so when we got there, um, we got our tickets. And I think you know by now that when you buy tickets, you buy for your, your crew as well, yes. right? So you have to buy four tickets. And so we bought the tickets, paid for, paid the money, and their printer jammed. Their printer jammed after printing three of the tickets, and the fourth ticket didn't come out. And she said, 
oh my gosh, she said, I'm having trouble, you know, fixing this printer. She goes, why don't you go ahead and get on the plane? Cause you're going to miss your change, your connection. And, um, uh, what we'll do is we'll call ahead, make sure they know, or maybe we were flying to Germany. So she said, we'll call ahead, let them know what happened and they will have your ticket waiting for you when you get there. And, and we were like, okay, that sounds like a plan. She's like, yeah, just go ahead and get on the plane. So we get on the plane, we get to, I think, Germany. And we get to the gate and we're telling the ticket agent that they were gonna call ahead for our ticket. And they said, what are you talking about? They did not know what we were talking about. No one called ahead. And they, um, they said, well, we can't issue tickets here anyway. Um, because we're at the gate, you have, you'd have to go out to the gate. And we, we said, and anybody knows on the show, if you have to go out of customs ever, you are just going to be done for, especially if you're in a time crunch, we were in a time crunch to catch the flight. And they said, well, we can't help you here. So we had to go out of the, the protected area or the customs area and go into the airport to try to go straighten it out. The lines were ridiculously long. They said it was some sort of holy holiday there. And it was just ridiculous numbers of people and lines and everybody's trying to get on different flights. We get to the front of the line and they said, we have no idea what you're talking about. And they said, we don't see anything, anything in the notes. And, <clears throat> and, and everybody's really crazy busy. We'll try to get a manager when we have the time, but we got to get these people on the flight. So it kept going downhill. And then we tried to get, cause we knew we were missing this flight. So we tried to get another flight and because of the, whatever holiday it was, it was just no flights, no flights available to go anywhere just to get out of there. So it was a really bad uh, move in retrospect. We should have never done it cause we probably would have still done well and still stayed in, you know, on, on top. And, um, it was a risk that we took and it was a gamble that didn't pay off. So it was very sad. Very yeah, sad. So, so obviously, uh, I actually forgot about this. So obviously in this episode, we saw that like the yields were and the yields were like in the future likes too. How annoying was that also like when you are eliminated and they have like three non elimination legs or something like that when it's like, like, Oswald and Danny finishing last, it's a non-elimination leg. Then somebody else finishes last, then it's a non-elimination leg, and then it's an elimination leg. Like, how annoying was that? Uh, um, did you feel like you were a target for a yield just because uh, you were a winner? Or, like, did you Well, you, you know what? I, I really thought that ours could have been a non-elimination um, leg that time, but because we were so far behind – because we couldn't get a flight out. Yeah. I, I, I really felt, and I don't know if this is true, but I felt like they had to change it because we, we just couldn't have caught up. Yeah, because the ending of it was really weird how they had like two non-eliminations or whatever back to back. Right. Like that. That's why I was thinking that should have been the one we were on and we probably would have been fine if we was just made a flight. But uh, we never figured out you know what happened they said they said oh all of your tickets printed already and they hadn't and so um and and you know it was their word against ours they were like well looking at our system uh, you were issued all the tickets you were supposed to get and we couldn't even buy another one because they were sold out so yeah, so how how disappointing was it to get eliminated because you've never done that before so what was that what was that feeling like? Because I've heard on people like other shows like Survivor, it's almost like a part of you dies inside. And I yeah. personally don't understand why people on Amazing Race are like, oh, we've had fun. Like, I would just be like, yeah, we had fun, but I would be pissed off. Like, you just lost a chance for a million dollars. So, yeah. Well, oh, no, you fun. die inside. It's a, it's a part of you that dies inside. It's really hard to smile and, and you know, say good things. And so I remember thinking I was trying to say something positive, but I didn't. It just wasn't in my spirit to say anything great. It was, um, it was quite depressing. So yeah, it was, it was sad, but, um, 
uh, one thing I don't know if anybody's shared it, uh, but is that the show did not, well, you know, there's always spoilers, right? And everybody yeah. likes to try to guess what's going to happen. We were the only black team on there. And so um, I think that the show thought if they didn't see a black couple, you know, that some people would say, oh, well, they're definitely out, you know, definitely been a spoiler um, alert. So we continued um, with the show. We continued. We didn't go home. <laughs> yeah, Joe and Bill talked about that, how you guys had a really great time being a decoy. He told you. <laughs> yeah, so what was, maybe just talk about that, because my last two questions are, do you have any fun pit stop stories from either of your seasons? Like, because... I remember they talked about in season one, how they maybe stayed at a, at a destination longer um, than what it was supposed to. So you have any fun memories from pit stops or, uh, and then do you have any fun memories from sequester? Because obviously in season 11, they had kind of a life at Ponderosa for amazing race when they stayed at this resort, but you guys were uh decors. So maybe talk about some of the things that uh, you did um, in, uh, being a decor and was that like kind of fun because you're not obviously stressed out being panicked and yeah yeah um so <laughs> i'm going cbs will probably kill me but no i don't think i think i can talk about anything now but um we had a great time actually we um like i said we went we stayed and followed wherever they went so when it was time to get off the plane we we'd run through the airport and uh, we do the whole screaming thing, get the car, hurry up, you know, we ran and then we do all of that until we get outside the door and then we go, ah, okay. And now where are we going? And then they put us up in a nice hotel. Um, we were somewhere, I forget where we were, but we, oh, we were in Macau and we stayed in a really beautiful hotel and um, separate from where the others stayed, where the people still on the race stayed. And um, we had like um, holders or, or people that were, you know, watching us that yeah. stayed with us. Um, and we met a guy at the front desk who said he was the general manager of the of the um, hotel and he asked us where we were from. So we struck up a friendly conversation with them. And, you know, we, we kind of made friends with this guy and he says, and we told him that, you know, we were on, we were on amazing race. And he said, he goes, Oh my God, you guys got to come back. I have some, some people here that I want you to meet. And we were like, well, we'll see if we can, because they pretty much, they want you to kind of stay out of, you know, the yeah, public yeah. kind of, yeah, and so, but we, we told our, our handler that um, we wanted, we knew where we wanted to go to dinner at. And when, and the guy, he called our room and said, okay, come now. And we were like, okay, we're going to go to our dinner right now. And, the, and our handler was like, okay, fine. So we go downstairs, we meet the, the, um, the um, guy who was the, the manager, the general manager, and we had seen people that looked like secret service in the hotel. And, um, and sure enough, while we're standing there, he walks up with, oh my God, I'm gonna draw a blank with his name. He's the owner of the Bellagio. He was, and he sold it and he bought, he bought the Wynn. What's his name? Steve Wynn. I think his name is Steve Wynn. He's the owner of it and he owned the hotel we were staying in in Macau because Macau in Hong Kong is is like the Vegas of Hong Kong and it's the place where everybody goes to gamble so all the same a lot of the same hotels they have in Vegas they have in Macau so this guy was the owner and he walks up and he introduces us and he's like you guys are really cool and <clears throat> and I remember he had a uh, astigmatism or something in his eye so he could only see out the side of his eye and so he has to get really close and yeah. you know so we had a very interesting conversation with him and he invited us to come to his um, New Year's Eve party in Vegas that next year oh, that He's my guest and he had this whole entourage of people and and security team and everything and he told the guy to 
take our name and you know and, and our number and invite us to the party and everything and it's so it was it was the coolest thing ever because i thought oh my god whenever would we meet i want to say steve Wynn is his name but of the Wynn hotel but uh so that was the cool that was the coolest and and just being able to travel with everyone and you know we went to hawaii we went to guam we went we went everywhere they went so that was fun and yeah, just, so you and, do like the detours and roadblocks like were you like the test uh i don't want to say like no so test dummies no no but um <clears throat> once we'd run through the airport that's usually where the fans catch uh, like yeah people, the spoilers and stuff the spoilers and they and they look for the the envelopes and they take the pictures in the airport and you're not supposed to talk to people in the airport when you're on the race because yeah. People remember the details and things that you said and but uh, I remember someone said on um, one of the spoilers that when we got on a plane that um, Uchenna asked for a drink and they said I know they're not on the race if they're asking for a drink because you're not allowed to and and we were we asked we said she says would, would you like to drink and we're like oh give me a vodka and tonic and we're like I'm just kidding I'm just kidding we said we were kidding but she said they're probably not even on the show because yeah. they're having a drink. So, um, but it was fun. That was, you know, just being able to travel and with no stress and not necessarily sitting with the camera crew. I'm sure that gave people pause and anybody who wanted to spoil things could have, <laughs> but, but it was fun. That part was really great. Yeah, and yeah, I think they do now that they're more like the stunt double, so where they get to actually like test the challenges, at least the finals and stuff like that. So I'm not sure if you guys lucked out or not. <laughs> it, well, no, we lucked out because I don't know if they do that all the time, but you know, they do that think... now. But um, I guess you guys got lucky that you got to enjoy it. Although it depends how you think about it. But uh, yeah, you know, we were lucky in, un in our unlucky situation. Do you have any fun uh, pit stop stories? Like obviously you got to stay in Africa and you talked about like seeing the monkeys or whatever, but any other was, like cool memories that maybe you had with other teams or something or? Um, you know, in Africa, when we were at the uh, River Kwai um, in Botswana, um, they did a traditional dance and, and um, singing. Uh, and that was the most, memorable time too for me because we were there with Rob and Amber, Meredith and Gretchen, uh, um, I, it, Lynn and Alex, but you know, we we're all sitting around this table and it was just so cool because we were all just so emotional, you know, just, and they were singing to us and dancing and in their tribal, you know, language and just, it was just the nicest, coolest brunch I've ever been to with the hippos in the background drop and the elephants in the backdrop so yeah that was that was cool the whole africa thing to me was was my favorite though by far it's great yeah and then my last two questions i promise um <laughs> if you could race with any partner other than you Chenna, who would it be and why Ooh. Someone that you guys would know, that people would know? Yes, maybe a former Amazing Racer. Like, who would you race with if you would pick anyone from the Amazing Race, maybe from your seasons to race with? Who would it be and why? Oh, wow. Ooh, hmm. That's interesting. Um, maybe. I would pick Uchenna again every time because he's great. Um, but... I was gonna say Chip, Chip, and Chip and Kim, Chip or Chip. Um, I like them. I I also love Joe and Bill, Bill and Joe. Um, um, oh, I remember the. Oh gosh, I can't think of his name. Um, mm. Give me a hint. I'm good at figuring this stuff out. Uh, he was he was gay and he dated. Uh, Chip Riken and Chip. Is that it? them one of them apparently I, yeah and i also love the brothers the tall brothers um oh my god what's their name uh greg and brian 
yeah, those two. I any of the either of those. Yeah, well, it's funny with the whole Riken and Chip thing because uh, the younger one of the two, uh, I think, was dating Lance Bass at the time. That's what I was gonna say. He dated Lance. Uh, yeah. They apparently, I'm not sure if they were supposed to be a team, but it was heavily rumored that uh, that Joe and Bill were like, "Are they gonna be a team?" Like. Like Riken and and, uh, and his Bass. partner or Lance, yeah. yeah um, I w- I got to be really close with Riken, um, and I met Lance through Riken, and um, I don't know. I can't imagine that that Lance would have done it. Lance didn't strike me as that athletic or wanting to work that hard. Yeah, I'm surprised you didn't mention Debbie from your season because I think she's uh, underrated as far as like not taking any bull, and I wish they. Might- I love Debbie. Yeah, I forgot about her. Further because, like, I mean, if you can scream and be pissed at Boston Rob, I don't think you're going to. Yeah, no, she's a cool chick. I, I, I like her. I also like the, um, the Miss Americas, um, the or the uh, Dustin and Candace. Candace is my girl. I, I adore her. Yeah, Candace. I would take Debbie. Um, yeah, there's a lot of girls that would be great. They would be badasses. So. And, yeah. then, and then, uh, well, you you answer my. Uh, how do you think you guys would fare in an all champion season? Well, and do you think Uchenna would do it with you? Because how do you think you would fare like now? Because it's been a while, so. You know, I mean, every season it seems like it really does get harder, and I think, ooh, glad we didn't have to do that. But, um, but I, you know, I think we'd do okay because because that's just our spirit. You know, we, we, we love the challenge. We love to win and we never give up, you know, tired, hungry, thirsty or anything. We just keep going. So, um, I think we do well. I mean, if we did, if we didn't win it, I would hate to be up against some real athletic jocks though. Cause boy, I'm the slow one. And so if I had to compete against guys that were just so, that, you know, Mr. America's, that would definitely be hard, but we we would definitely give them a good run. Although a lot of the athletic jocks now who won the race are like 40, not that's old, but like they were like 25 yeah. when they won it and now right. they're 40 and it's like a big gap. So who knows? But uh, <laughs> that is all the questions that I have. Thank you so much for being <laughs> on your podcast and being so patient. Longest podcast ever that i've done and i'll <laughs> edit it quickly wow me too and if thank you so much and i'll definitely let you know when this is posted okay you're welcome I-